All right, hi guys, thanks for waiting as we are getting set up here today for our stream. Welcome to Fox 5 Live, June 22nd, 2018. We're here on this Friday, happy Friday. I wanna jump right into some breaking news right now. Uh, in New York City, right outside of the NFL headquarters, Gloria Allred, she represents a lot of um, people in the celebrity world, but today she's representing some former Houston Texan cheerleaders who are outside the NFL headquarters in protest for this lawsuit uh, where one of the cheerleaders claims she was duct taped for the team without her consent, duct taped, um, as in literally taped up for being skinny fat is what her quote was. And Gloria Allred is here representing her. I believe they'll be speaking. I know um, she is up at the podium right now. So let's jump right up there to New York City and check into what this is all about. Again, a former Houston Texan cheerleader claims she was duct taped. She's coming forward with these allegations. Uh, her skin was literally taped um, against her will. So let's check in and ask that you take action to prevent these egregious acts on the part of greedy team owners who have no regard for women. Your response to my letter was delivered by your lawyer. In essence, it stated that the NFL would continue to allow exploitation of women so long as they are paid minimum wage. You abdicated any responsibility for what occurs in these cheerleader programs even though it is an integral part of these NFL teams. Your response flies in the face of the arbitration agreements that our clients signed, which called upon you to determine whether their dispute is, quote, football oriented, end quote. In which case, according to the contract, you will be the arbitrator of that dispute. The NFL should stand for more than just greed. We expected you as the NFL commissioner to take a meaningful stand in support of fairness for women. We wanted courage, action, and change. Mr. Goodall, you dropped the ball. Instead of scoring a goal for women's rights, you retreated to the locker room with your head down and your eyes looking for a safe harbor. There is none. Women know who their friends are and who is sitting on the sidelines. You should be the quarterback for the NFL on this important issue, instead of carrying the water for the team owners. To say that we are disappointed with your response would be an understatement. What you have said at this critical time is that you are passing the buck, or should I say, passing the ball. You should join the team for equal rights rather than the teams that are running in the wrong direction as far as women's equal rights are concerned. You argue in your letter that you do not have the power to force the team owners to change their cheerleader programs or how much they pay women cheerleaders. We question that in light of the contracts that clearly do give you the power you claim that you lack. But in any event, taking a stand does not take power. It takes courage and a commitment to values. You apparently have neither one. Very truly yours, Gloria Allred. And now I'd like to present Angelina Rose Rosa. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, and I'll go on the other side. Hello, my name is Angelina Rosa. Thank you so much for being with me here today. Initially, when I thought about stepping forward with my case, I held myself back out of fear and shame for shedding a negative light on something I once believed so strongly in. However, the more I sat and thought about the ordeals I have faced as a Houston Texans cheerleader, I realized my silence would only encourage the same treatment to be done to the next girl caught up in the whirlwind of achieving her dreams, only to be devastated at the reality of being overworked, undercompensated, bullied, 
torn down, and ultimately used to profit a multi-billion dollar organization that she actually supports. Isn't that insane? How could that be one's reality? As a child, I grew up a tomboy, loving and playing every sport. I also loved to dance. I felt alive playing baseball, basketball, flag football, tennis, you name it. However, I can still remember my father taking me to various sporting events and me immediately falling in love with the game, but even more so with the beautiful ladies on the court and field, dancing, interacting, and entertaining the fans. What could be better than dancing courtside, cheering for my favorite sports teams? Like many girls in my position, I fell in love with the dream of one day becoming a professional cheerleader. As a cheerleader, I hope to become an integral part of not just the game, but the community. I love to create memorable moments for fans, to brighten up their day, and create moments they could always reflect happily upon. In my eyes, the job was about spreading happiness and smiles and being a part of something bigger than myself. I wanted to be a leader and a role model to the young girls like I once was and show with hard work, focus, and dedication, dreams do come true. After dancing professionally for the Chicago Bulls and later joining the Houston Astros Shooting Stars, in that moment, it truly felt like I was living out my dreams. Unfortunately, once joining the Houston Texans, I was faced with the harsh reality of working in a hostile work environment. On numerous occasions, I was belittled and body shamed. I was often described and called out with the term skinny fat. The coach explained, I look skinny fat and I needed to work on this if I wanted to continue dancing in the games. My weight has been pretty consistent my entire life. Thus, I developed very unhealthy eating habits just to maintain the image she demanded for me. One game, as the girls were leaving the locker room to perform, the coach told me to remain behind. She then stated, Angelina, you are about to be cut for a lifetime. I had no clue what she was referring to as I had worked very hard on my appearance. She then walked me over to a corner of the locker room with herself and several other alumni helpers. Before I knew it, Texans logo dub tick was found and I heard this will hurt a bit as I watched my skin being pulled, stretched and taped tightly on myself. I believe that was the worst part watching myself being taped as other alumni watched. I felt humiliated and ashamed of my own body. I knew my team would be performing any minute and all I could do was think how I didn't want to let them down. Although I wanted to hide and cry, I waited for the coach's final approval and ran down the tunnel to proceed with my team on the field and continuing to dance with all I could, fighting the pain through a smile. I stand here today to try and make sure no other girl or woman has to endure this same humiliation. What other profession has thousands of people competing for a handful of spots only to body shame them, bully them, dictate what other jobs they can have, all while paying them $7.25 per hour? I think an entire reform on how professional cheerleaders are treated is long overdue. Thank you. Thank you. So let me have this one. So let's talk a little bit about what happened here. It was duct tape like this? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, it was. All right, so I don't have a scissor to cut this right now, but essentially what happened was what? Can you describe what happened with this duct tape? Absolutely. Okay. As you know, our midgets are revealing. 
So in order to slim down my waist, my skin on the side was pulled down and it's very hard to do because I'm not a bigger weight person. It was pulled down and with the tape taped under my shorts just to slim out the area right here, which is even pretty hard to do myself. So it's pretty um, crazy that that was a requirement for me just to dance with my teammates on the field. And when was this? What date? Roughly. Um, this was actually the pink game. I'm not sure the exact date. Yeah, but I mean, what year? It was this year, okay. this past season. And so, were you about the same size? Absolutely, absolutely. So you haven't gained or lost weight since that time? No. And so, but nonetheless, this was. Used. But Houston Texans duct tape, on this side, both and then sides. on the both sides, about from where to where from. So from right here, like trying to pull it down so that my shorts cover the tape. Mm -hmm. So then your top covered the tape? Yes. Okay, so we do also have uh, some photos of her uh, as a Houston Texan cheerleader, which Hannah also was a Houston Texans cheerleader. So you're about the same size. So these are some of the photos of her as a Houston Texans cheerleader. We'll be happy to also email some of these to you if you would like them. She owns them. She gives you permission to use them today. May I give you that? Thank you. So we have these. There's no reason for any woman who looks the way she looks to be duct taped. For that matter, there's no reason for anyone to be duct taped, whether they're a Houston Texans cheerleader or not. It's ridiculous to call a person who looks like this skinny fat. First of all, nobody should be called fat, let alone skinny fat. But it's just, it's beyond absurd to say that someone who is thin is not thin, is skinny fat. What is skinny fat mean? Can answer that. Oh, can you? Okay, go ahead. Uh, let me just show this one more and then she will answer that question, which is a really good question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, Angelina. Okay, got it? Good. Would you like to answer the skinny fat question? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. That was a great question. Um, skinny fat is the term the coach frequently used to say that we're skinny, but we're not toned. So we don't have necessarily the abs or the dimension or the perfection that they require for us um, on the field, which I think is insane because we all are beautiful. We made the team for a reason. I stayed consistent with my weight. So it's really bizarre to do my job and still feel like it wasn't good enough. And, and how painful was it when you were cheerleading with this duct tape on you? Absolutely. I think that was the hardest part because I'm, I'm a team player. I love my team and I wanted to be there for them. I danced with my entire might and it was extremely painful. My skin was being torn because of the movements of going out and being so um, big that it kind of tore my skin out of the tape. Once I went home, I was so sweaty. The tape was really, really hard to come off. It was adhesed to my skin. So, I mean, the whole entire process was very painful. Did anyone ask you, uh, Angelina, is it okay if we apply duct tape to your skin? Absolutely not, absolutely not. So it was done without your consent? It was done without my consent and I really didn't under even stand the reasoning for it. To be the only girl out of 35 girls to have that done to, that's unbelievable. So again, that was a photo of her as this. And so we, we'll take we'll take some questions now. Just to add, we did file an amended lawsuit for her in Texas this morning, adding her to our previous lawsuit, adding certain claims like assault, which this is. As we, that is what we allege in our lawsuit, uh, and uh, you know, sexual harassment, hostile workplace, and so forth. So, now so the now, there now are six in the lawsuit, 
including Angelina. All right, your, your question, please. Oh, okay. And we have a case number. We can also email you the complaint afterwards. Pardon me? Uh, you know, we don't have any comment on this particular coach as to whether she's still employed. What we're most concerned about now is the persons that we allege are victims. That's our six clients. So, but you can contact the Houston Texans and see. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I did. I chose not to try out again. I was on the team for two years, and I just decided that it was enough. I knew that standing up on my own wasn't going to do much good, so I just decided to move on. I'm really proud of my teammates that have stepped forward, and I'm really proud to be joining them. So you would have had to try out again to be on the team? Yes, ma'am. That's what everyone has to it's do? It's a requirement every And that's season. what you chose not to do? Absolutely. And is that because of what you experienced and endured during your time Absolutely. as a Houston Texans NFL cheerleader? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Do you have any idea how long these have been going on in the NFL? How long what's been going on? Well, all I can say is there are other lawsuits filed against other teams in the NFL alleging other inequities and abuses. So, uh, and I don't know, maybe there'll be more in the future, but this is a national issue. We're not the only lawsuit. And I'm sure that there will be others who will be also filing in the future. And that's why the NFL commissioner needs to do something. Um, other than hide or say that he has no power to do anything when clearly under the arbitration agreement he is the NFL commissioner is specifically named status of our lawsuit is we filed it uh, earlier this month and uh, it's pending and we've added well, that is we've amended the lawsuit and added Angelina this morning and that's the status of our lawsuit it's pardon me oh we're asking for compensatory and punitive damages according to proof at trial you know the pressure has been enormous in fact maybe you could say something about whether you went days without eating or made any sacrifices in terms of eating and what kind of pressure you were under on account of having to keep a certain weight or look. Um, yes, thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, I was told several times about the skinny fat term and that I needed to do something about it to remain in the games. I took that very seriously. I did everything I could because the time frame is short to lose the weight, which made me actually have very unhealthy eating habits and really um, treated my body not how I should just to get those results that she wanted. Well, well, we don't know whether it was a punishment or whether they perceived it was necessary. Uh, either way, it was hurtful and damaging to her. Uh, so you would have to ask them what their intention was. In that specific moment, I had no time. My team already left the field. They were going to perform any minute, and I didn't want to miss that chance to be with them. I, I, I feel like my team is my family, and I would never disappoint them. So in the moment, I just did what had to be done to go. But looking back, of course, I would have definitely had stood up for myself and for my beliefs because I don't think that that was right. There also was a culture of fear that was uh, in the environment uh, and which cheerleaders were reminded, according to the cheerleaders, that they were replaceable, that they could be cut, uh, that she could, uh, would, that she might not be able to continue to cheer if she didn't go along, get along, and essentially say yes to whatever they were asking. Would you, absolutely. would you want to elaborate on that without giving names? Yes, absolutely. I mean, Gloria is speaking the truth. Fear on our team was huge. Nobody wanted to talk out. Nobody wanted to step up, even though we all felt the same. None of us had the courage at the time to do that. So the fact that we're able to do that now, it speaks volumes because at the time we felt so ashamed. We felt like our voices couldn't be heard. And if they were heard, then it would just 
detriment what we were trying to do in our career. What kind of what kind of threats were made to cheerleaders on the team that you heard that you were aware of in reference to whether you had to do things or didn't have to do things, and if you didn't do them, what would happen? I mean, to them, we were repla replaceable. The first thing she said that day was, Angelina, you're about to be cut for a lifetime. That's ridiculous. Nobody can be a cheerleader for a lifetime. She knows how important these games are to me. So to even just have that be the first statement that she says, you're about to be cut for a lifetime, that's not right. So in other words, you got to be, you have to be duct taped if you're going to be able to continue as a Houston Texans cheerleader would be what most people, reasonable people would believe was meant by that statement. Were there other kinds of statements even at other times in reference to the cheerleaders and whether they had to do what they were told to do? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, another Latina on the team got told that if she didn't look her part that she would easily get replaced by another Hispanic girl. Um, we're all the time being told previous past years what the other girls did wrong. I mean, that's ridiculous. We had shown videos of girls messing up in games. We, uh, She really talked down about all these girls that that were a part of the organization, why would you do that? There was no yeah, need. But the main thing was the fear and, and threats, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so for example, we're, we'll have to wait for the bells, okay. We're just waiting for the bells. Can I ask a question? Uh, wait, uh, wait, we're, we're, we're gonna take that in a minute as soon as the bell stops. Okay, well, you gonna go for a while? Wait. I, well, I just want to say we're gonna go, we're gonna take that, but let me just finish with that because I want to um, say something about who was somebody asked something about who was there. So I want to say there were other okay. There were others who were present who witnessed the duct taping. That's the point I wanted to make. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Okay. So, we're seeking damages according to proof at trial. That would be compensatory damages, damages for pain and suffering. We're also seeking lost wages because we also, because we also allege that, uh, that even at this paltry minimum wage of $7.25 an hour, that many of the cheerleaders were not even paid for all of the hours that they worked. And um, in addition, we're seeking punitive damages, damages to punish, that's damages uh, which would indicate that it, this kind of conduct shocks the conscience of the community. And uh, we're also seeking uh, their attorney's fees. Um, you're you're Pardon me? This, this other young woman is part of the law. Yes, Hannah, uh, Hannah Turnbow was one of the original five plaintiffs in this lawsuit, which we have amended today to add Angelina to this lawsuit. It's not a class action, it's individual cases, but it's in one lawsuit. Hannah was an NFL cheerleader for the Houston Texans from what state to wait? Uh, 2017 to 2018. And she was at our last press conference. What, uh, how much, when you were called skinny fat, how much did you weigh? How much did she weigh when she was called skinny fat? Yeah, absolutely. I don't mind. My weight is pretty consistent. I stay about 125. I would say like about 5'4". And how much did you work out every day in order to stay fit for the Houston Texans? Absolutely. I would work out in the morning and in the afternoon, I would say three, four times out of the week. We also have a trainer and she mandatory works us out during practices. So, I mean, my day was consumed with working out, work, going to practices. So it's pretty ridiculous that no matter what I did, it, it wasn't good enough for her. Did you ever feel that you had to stop eating or modify what you were eating in order to remain the fit person that you are? Oh yes, absolutely, absolutely. We were told frequently to eat less, to watch what we're eating. If we weren't looking the way we were and we didn't have a lot of time to work out, we were told like, don't eat, like do what you have to do to look the part. And were there days when you when you didn't eat or ate very little? Yes, I don't mean to make this a comedy, but at my job, the boss literally told me that I made her shop smell like a movie theater because all I ate was popcorn and water. She saw how miserable I was and she 
told me that it, this was ridiculous. And at the time, I, I didn't even see it. And looking back, I, I'm appalled at how I treated myself. So you were doing that to try to keep your weight down, even though you were working out so much every day? Yes, ma'am. Essentially, you weren't eating in order to keep your job. Absolutely. Nobody, no woman should have to have an unhealthy diet in order to keep her job and remain in a sexual stereotype which is of what a beautiful woman is supposed to look like. Have you ever to take dietary supplements to lose weight by the coaches? Actually, that's kind of frowned upon. It's really bad for your body, so we weren't told specifically to use those, those type of supplements. Okay. Any other? What you would say to NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell? I would say that it's pretty ridiculous that they're taking advantage of women who actually love the game. They, we love the sport. We love the fans. It's and you love the team, right? And we do. We absolutely love the team. It's an honor for us to wear the team name on our chest. So the fact that they're taking advantage of that love and our commitment to the team um, and really shaming us and making us feel like we're not good enough, I think that that's sad and it needs to change. It, the time is now. I actually don't agree. I don't think it's outdated. I think we really add a lot of excitement and fun to the game. Like I said, when I was a young girl, I would look at those cheerleaders in awe. I still get that from children. We are like, you know, so big in their eyes and it shows the importance of having a role model or someone to look up to when you're young. Any other questions? Okay. Are you done with the cheerleading? Uh, I am actually done cheerleading. This this was the worst experience I have to date. Um, I, di I did professional dancing for four years, and I think at this point, I, I don't think that I deserve uh, I don't I don't deserve that treatment, and I'm ready to move on with my life because there's no reason to be doing that for seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour. There's just no reason. Absolutely. I would tell her to do her research. I think every team is different. I think every girl's experience is different. We've seen that a lot with a lot of girls on our team coming out saying they had a great experience. That's wonderful, but not everybody does. So I would really want her to do the research, to know what she wants to get out of it, read the contract, know what they're telling you that they want from you, and see if then she still wants to do it. What is your message to the current cheerleaders? Absolutely. I love the cheerleaders. I, I know that they're having a good time. It, it, they, it was a right decision for them, and it, it does not bother me that they're still doing it. I encourage them to do what's best for them. But these are the courageous agents of change because they're no longer NFL cheerleaders. They can speak out, and they do so because they want to make life better for the future NFL cheerleaders, and it takes their courage for us to be able to win that change. And we intend to win justice for these cheerleaders and the change that they deserve. So um, I'm gonna go deliver the letter. Copy. And we hope never to see another Houston Texans NFL cheerleader or anyone else ever duct taped again. I mean, this is an outrage. There is, we've always said there's no excuse for abuse. This is abuse as far as I'm concerned. So, okay, thank you. So we'll just go up here. Um, here. I think actually I'll deliver the duct tape to him too.
All right, y'all, so a pretty emotional scene outside of NFL headquarters in New York City. That's what you're looking at right there. Look at that wide shot of the building. That was a pretty uh, long, I would say, news conference there with Gloria Allred. As you know, she represents uh, people like this and uh, celebrities in the celebrity world as well. Sarah and one of our interns is coming over here to join me because we were watching this press conference. And by the way, thank you guys for all of your comments as we were watching along with you on our stream. Um, pretty interesting topic, horrible to kind of hear what this girl went through. And we were Definitely. talking we were talking about uh, Gloria Allred as an attorney. We've taken her on the stream numerous times defending various people and, and lawsuits that, that come up. But you were mentioning something interesting about her and her daughter. Yeah, I know her and her daughter um, were kind of conflicted about the Harvey Weinstein case. And I know um, that Lisa Bloom, I think she was originally <coughs> representing mm -hmm. um, Harvey Weinstein and her mom was just super against it. And I guess like as soon as like Lisa Bloom started getting more information about what was going on, she just backed away and she said no, like she could not defend this man. Yeah. And it's just, it's amazing to see that the duo was always a part of something monumental and now we see her defending the cheerleader mm -hmm. and with the situation that's gone on there. They're always on top of their game and always trying to um, help people and fight for what's right. I didn't think I knew that she originally, her daughter originally was going to be possibly defending him. Yeah. yeah. It was like this whole thing on Twitter and they were, right. yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah, what a story. I'm trying to read through some of your comments, guys, and see what you're thinking. Um, it's it's definitely horrific to have to, to see women have to go through this. Definitely. And, um, you know, we hope that they push through with this lawsuit. So Definitely. Anyway, thanks for watching with me, for making a few comments. If you guys have any more thoughts, let us know in the live chat. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit because, gosh, this is so cool. Historical, let's go to history, a little nerding out right now. Um, Civil War remains continue to be found in Virginia and wow. there are so many battlegrounds that you can visit and you can kind of explore and just get a piece of history and recently um, there were some remains of two soldiers found in like a ditch or something of the sort in Manassas Virginia so pretty close by and this was a really cool story yesterday our anchor Allison Seymour got to interview um, one of the women who work for that park that battleground and uh, talk a little bit more about what they found and what it means and a little piece of history really coming to life um, and it's right in our backyard. So check out this little segment that we have uh, from one of our shows. I think you'll find it interesting. War battlefield in Northern Virginia. The National Park Service announcing that they, along with the Smithsonian experts, have found the remains of two Union soldiers in what was known as a surgical pit. It offers new insight into battlefield medicine uh, almost 160 years ago. It's described as simply an amazing find. And joining us now from deep cut at Manassas National Battlefield is Caitlin Liming. She's a public affairs specialist at the National Park Service. You all must be thrilled. What an amazing find. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, it's an unprecedented discovery. Um, and it's, it's a great way for us to continue to tell the story of this battlefield. And Caitlin, behind you, can you just tell us exactly where you are right now in relation to this story? Sure, so I'm here in Manassas National Battlefield Park, and I'm at an area that we call Deep Cut, and it's an area where a major part of the Second Battle of Manassas took place, and it's an area where we think these two soldiers may have been wounded. Wow, and this was in August of 1862, right? Correct, yeah. And we, we started off by saying it was found in a surgical pit. Uh, it's gruesome, it, war is not pretty, especially uh, the Civil War injuries and how they handled the injuries. Can you tell us about that surgical pit and where these two fallen soldiers were found? Sure, so they were found in a pit alongside 11 partial amputated limbs. Um, so this is an area where surgeons would have had to quickly amputate limbs of soldiers in, a, in an effort to save their lives. Um, unfortunately, uh, the, these two soldiers that were found um, probably had wounds that were too severe to be saved. Um, so the surgeons would have decided that there was probably nothing they could do. Wow, and now I'm just so curious, there's so many questions, but how did scientists know or archeologists know exactly who these uh, soldiers, what side they were on? What did they find uh, besides the limbs and the remains of these two? Sure, so there's a lot of historical and archeological clues that helped us um, gain a better idea of who these men were. Um, 
For example, there were four buttons found near one of the soldiers that clue us in that he was a Union soldier. Um, also, the one man had a bullet lodged in his upper right femur, that, um, and it was a, a bullet that would have been used by the Confederate Army. So that tells us again that he was probably a Union soldier. Um, but we've also been able to look at clues from their isotopes to learn what kind of food they might have eaten and what area of the country they might have been from. Um, and, um, you know, all these details help us paint a story of, of who these men could have been. And it's fascinating. But Caitlin, how close do you think you'll ever get to knowing who exactly these men were? Because we're talking about it because it's an amazing find, a one in a million thing. But they're also somebody's son, possibly husband. You know, will we ever put a name to these bodies? I think it's unlikely that we'll ever put a, a name to these bodies. Um, but I think we can learn, you know, about their ages, about their, you know, their body types, right. about um, their wounds and, um, the, you know, the uniforms they wore. So I, I think we can still learn about them and honor them, um, even though we may never know their names. And they will be buried. We have to let you go. But in coffins made from trees right there in the area, sort of uh, indigenous to where they took their last breath. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What a wonderful um, and fitting ending. Very beautiful, though bittersweet. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Amazing. Sure. Thank you. All righty. Uh, Caitlin, thank you. We'll still ahead at eight. We're going to check in with Kevin McCarthy for a look at this morning's top entertainment <laughs> headlines. So again, really cool story, guys, coming out of Virginia. I thought that was a really interesting one. I wanted to make sure we included that on the stream today. Um, history right here in our backyard in Virginia. In other news, guys, turning over now to uh, some sad news, actually, for sort of the Fox News Channel world and really the world at large and the political commentating world. You may have heard this, but um, renowned notable Pulitzer Prize winner and psychiatrist, also political co commentator Charles Krauthammer, has died at the age of 68. Um, he was Harvard-trained, best-selling author. Um, I know he has a per personal connection to a lot of people who work with our parent company and who maybe have some sort of connection to um, 21st Century Fox or Fox News in general. What an interesting life he led as well when he sort of started on the politics side as a speechwriter for Walter Mondale. So on the Democratic side, so under when he was under Jimmy Carter, and then he turned over and um, worked uh, very extensively sort of in the Reagan days and the Ronald Reagan kind of side and became sort of what you call um, a classical conservative in, voice in politics and in news. Um, but I think whatever side you're on, so many people had so much respect for this man. I know personally um, I was quite close with, I am quite close with his son, Dan, and so we're sending our condolences out to his family. Uh, Fox News put together a tribute and um, this all came after there was a heartbreaking letter written by him uh, explaining that he what he was undergoing and how he had fallen ill to cancer that was going to very abruptly take his life. And uh, he wrote that and it kind of was disseminated out into the public and the media. And then uh, yesterday he did unfortunately pass away. So many tributes are, are sort of being put together out there, videos kind of encapsulating who he was as a contributor and as a person. And I thought this one was quite poignant. So I'm gonna play this one out um, so you, you guys can kind of get a feel for who he was and um, that we all remember him today. Columnist and Fox News contributor Charles Krauthammer has passed away. We told you recently that Charles had announced that he only had weeks to live after a long battle with cancer. Charles was 68 years old. Brett takes a look back now at an extraordinary life. It's my job to call a folly a folly. Charles Krauthammer, columnist, author, and Fox News commentator, lived his life telling others exactly what he thought. You're betraying your whole life if you don't say what you think and you don't say it honestly and bluntly. It was that quality that brought Charles to Fox News Channel during Britt Hume's tenure as anchor. So this is not a man designed for television. You, you look at him and say, this is not a potential TV star. In fact, he became a huge star, even I would almost say a megastar on this channel. And it was the sheer force of his intellect and the power of his thinking. And on top of that, there was a gentleness about him personally that if he disagreed with you, you know, you never felt attacked. You know, he just disagreed with you. It was always unspoken on the panel that he was always the leader because of his delivery, his intellect. Special report stage manager Mary Pat Dennard was on set with Charles every night for years. 
It was kind of all an ongoing joke on the panel that Brett Bear has a signal when people need to wrap up. I give him 30, so Brett puts his arm out. And uh, Charles was on the show forever, and we always laughed that I don't think he paid attention to that once. He had something to say. He was going to say it. No time constraints were going to control him on that. Born in 1950s New York to Jewish parents who left World War II era Europe, Charles' father raised his son to value the pursuit of knowledge. His motto for us was, I want you to know everything. I want you to learn everything. You don't have to do everything, but you got to know everything. He thought that was part of life. The family lived in Montreal and summered at their cottage in Long Beach, New York. It was a paradisical childhood. My brother and I were inseparable. He always insisted I be included. So I got used to being around the big boys and taking the slings and arrows and that's how you get toughened up. As a senior at McGill University in Canada, Krauthammer became captivated by political journalism. He applied to medical school to appease his family and was accepted to Harvard. But Krauthammer put off attending and enrolled at Oxford instead. It was there that he met fellow student from Australia, Robin Trethaway, who would later become his wife. Charles reversed course and headed back to the U.S. to attend Harvard. Why did you choose psychiatry? I was looking for something halfway between the reality of medicine and the elegance, if you like, of philosophy. So uh, psychiatry was the obvious thing. It was there that one unexpected moment, a tragic diving accident, changed Charles' life forever. It had just hit at precisely the angle where all the force was transmitted to one spot, and that is the uh, cervical vertebra which severed the spinal cord. When did you realize that the accident was life-altering? The second it happened. Despite his permanent paralysis, Charles astounded his professors and classmates by graduating on time near the top of his class. Ultimately, he decided the field wasn't for him. A career reversal he joked about on Fox decades later. And I'm a psychiatrist in remission, <laughs> doing very well. I haven't had a relapse in 25 years. In 1978, Krauthammer headed to Washington, D.C. for a government job. I thought, once I'm in Washington, isn't that where they do politics? One thing will lead to another. Robert encouraged him to follow his dreams, and he soon landed at the left-leaning New Republic magazine, just as the Reagan administration took office. So help me God. Krauthammer found himself agreeing with the new president and questioning his own feelings about the Democratic Party. I ended up supporting just about every element of the Reagan uh, for our policy. Months after Reagan's re-election, Krauthammer penned the phrase, the Reagan Doctrine, in a provocative Time magazine column, and the name stuck. He created the Reagan Doctrine. Nobody had heard of it. Charles uh, put together a piece and dubbed it, and you know, I've read it many times, and it just holds up so well. I think Charles discovered then that there really was a lot to Reagan. But it would take years before Charles fully embraced domestic conservative ideals. It took me about a decade. I was skeptical of tax cuts. I was skeptical of smaller government at the beginning. And then by the end of the 80s, I had begun to change. In 1985, his son Daniel was born. And two years later, Charles won the biggest honor in journalism, the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> But it was the events of September 11, 2001, that brought a more forceful tone to his commentary and a regular spot on the special report panel. Over the years, Charles became an audience favorite. The biggest error that we make is to lose the damn war because we refuse to recognize who the enemy is and what it requires. For God's sake, why do you have to talk about that? The morning is over, the shiva is done, uh, and if you're a you know if you're a conservative, you should be optimistic. I think it'll you know it'll snow in hell before uh, the DOJ is going to go after her. We all were expecting it. It didn't happen. That was the dog that didn't bark. Despite all of his accomplishments, awards, and high-profile endorsements, Krauthammer was always humble and at times uneasy with the influence his words held. Now I think about it and um, I find it worrisome. The reason is that when I was totally unknown, I could say anything I damn well pleased. That included when his opinions reached presidents. Uh, read uh, Charles Krauthammer's uh, column in the Post. That he's a, a brilliant man. Well, you know, when you get praise from President Clinton and you're from my side of the 
of the aisle. That means that my career is done. I mean, I'm toast. Krauthammer's high standards for political leaders were bipartisan for President Obama. When I think he's done just about everything wrong. <laughs> to then-candidate Donald Trump. This is the strongest field of Republican candidates in 35 years. You could pick a dozen of them at random and have the strongest cabinet America's had in our lifetime. And instead, all our time is spent discussing this rodeo clown. I don't think I've ever heard such a stream of disconnected ideas since I quit psychiatry 30 years ago. As far as Charles Krauthammer, I'm not a fan of his. I think he's a highly overrated pundit. He's wrong on so many things. Charles Krauthammer, who, by the way, in Canada Casino, put his first money on... I saw Trump. that. I couldn't believe it. Did you see that? Thank you, Charles. I'm going to make you look good, Charles. <laughs> in recent years, as a Republican administration took office, Charles didn't shy away from his trademark, blunt, unabashedly critical analysis when it came to President Trump. Presidents don't talk like this. They never have. This is what it sounds like when you're living in a banana republic. Charles had other loves aside from politics. He played chess and was an avid baseball fan. I grew up playing the game. I love to play the game. And loved nothing more than seeing his Washington Nationals play and win. Know the glory. You know, and with the White House on fire, the Congress in chaos, and the world going to hell in a handbasket, we need happy news like this. This is why God created baseball late on the sixth day. Friends at Fox News Channel remember that quick wit and Charles' love for talking to anyone. The Swish Report has a lot of people that come in and watch it, and they were always in awe of Charles and always very, you know, apprehensive about approaching him. And I would always say, please go say something to him. He would love to talk to you, and he was always so friendly to everyone. In 2013, Krauthammer released a book, Things That Matter, and summed up the survivor's spirit that has guided much of his life, writing, quote, the catastrophe that awaits everyone from a single false move, wrong turn, fatal encounter. Every life has such a moment. What distinguishes us is whether and how we ever come back. There's an element of that in everybody's story, their low point. Do you want it enough, and are you lucky enough? That's a part of it, too. In mid-June, Krauthammer announced that he'd been diagnosed with cancer, and doctors had given him just weeks to live, writing, I leave this life with no regrets. It was a wonderful life, full and complete, with the great loves and great endeavors that make it worth living. I am sad to leave, but I leave with the knowledge that I lived the life that I intended. Do you think you'll ever stop writing? No, I intend to die at my desk. Really? I would like to. I'm not sure I can arrange it. <laughs> Charles Krauthammer was 68 years old. So definitely an emotional tribute there to the late Charles Krauthammer. We hope that you uh, were able to enjoy that with some really amazing snippets um, from Brett Baer's interview with him over the years. Uh, turning now, staying on the political theme, let's jump into the House floor right now. Uh, House Democrats are debating immigration. It looks like it was getting pre pretty heated a couple minutes ago. Uh, we also have a couple other things coming down right now, so we'll keep you varied on that and bring you some of the top stories from our sister stations across the country as well. So now jumping into the House floor, guys. If you don't think the actions prior don't take place to now, we've sat in those rooms. We talked about border security. Interesting part, though, Mr. Speaker. The other side of the aisle that said they were for border security, they were going to perpetuate the problem we currently have. Because they did not want to end this catch and release. They are going to put families in harm's way. They questioned whether you could actually have a border of a wall. That's really the philosophical debate we're talking about. Now, we'll wor work through this bill. There are some other parts of the bill we're working on this weekend. Any changes that come to a conclusion, of course, we'll let you know. But much of what this bill is, is the same thing that we talked down at the White House about, and we talked for those numbers of hours inside my office about. But Mr. Speaker, if the gentleman on the other side said he was never going to shut down the government, but he voted to do it this time, 
If they said they were concerned about CHIP, but they would vote against it when we'd bring it to the floor. But you know what we had to do? We had to carry it on our own. And you know what happened for the American children? The longest it's ever been renewed, 10 years. So yes, we want to work with you. But if the idea is to stop anything from happening to the American public, do not expect me to stop. It's too important. So if we have to push through on our own, we will. And you made a statement, my friend, that this body is one-sided. So don't take my word for it. Let's go to Quorum, a company that only focuses on data, only focuses on measurements. You know what they said about this Congress? 70% of the bills signed into law this Congress have one Republican and one Democrat co-sponsor. The highest rate in the past 20 years for bipartisanship. So you know the bills that we bring to the floor? Despite the leadership's push, and the, every week, Mr. Speaker, we can see the actions. What was the action that you held everybody to the last minute for those 23 people who wanted to vote for the appropriation bill? They had to wait till the Republicans carried it. Then you released them to vote for it. Or we talk about the farm bill. Every day, Mr. Speaker, I come back here, I see the ranking member on the other side put a, put a letter out to her members to not vote for whatever comes. And yes, we on this side of the aisle want to solve DACA. But I know I read your tweets just as well. Dreamers can still apply to renew DACA protections. But you know what, in our bill, we deal with the DACA situation. But you know what else we also deal with? We deal with the border. We deal with security. Because we do not want to be back here in another two, five years with the same problem we are today. Even if you won't work with us from the children's health insurance, from funding of government, from appropriation for our veterans, you want to hold those votes back? I don't think the public wants to hold those back. And you know what? If we have to push forward, we will. And I will not apologize for it. This country is too important. The problems are too big. And I can listen, Mr. Speaker, to every argument we make. But I will just think the American public can look at the data. You know what today is, Mr. Speaker? The sixth month anniversary of the tax bill passing. You know what else it is? One million new jobs. You know what else it is? Unemployment below 4%. And in the last 49 years of this country, unemployment below 4% has only been seven months in 49 years. But two of those seven months were April and May of this year. Unemployment claims, 44-year low. And for the first time in the history of this nation, there are more jobs being offered than there are people looking for them. So all that rhetoric, all those arguments you made, building up to that tax bill, the Armageddon, the crumbs, how terrible this is going to be, Six months later, history proves different. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? If we waited and waited for the Democrats, there would be not a million new jobs. There would not be unemployment where it is. Because, Mr. Speaker, there wasn't one Democrat to vote for it. Even though a number of them privately told me on this floor they wanted to, but their leadership told them no. So if we have to solve the economy and we have to solve immigration on our own, we will. And I yield back. He didn't answer the question, of course. He hardly ever does. 400,000 more jobs created in 2016 than 2017. He doesn't say that. <clears throat> they inherited a growing economy. We inherited, uh, when President Obama took off, a receding economy, economy her hemorrhaging 787,000 jobs in January of 2009. He doesn't talk about that. That was after the two tax cuts that they passed in 01 and 03 that they said would create the greatest economy we've ever seen. It didn't. He didn't say that. He didn't say that the only time we balanced the budget was under, uh, for four years, was up pres President Clinton and created jobs and had the best economy uh, he's experienced and I've experienced. He didn't say that. And what he didn't say is why we are not bringing to this floor a 
four pieces of legislation, giving everybody on the floor the opportunity to express their opinion and say to the American people how they think we can address, yes, border security, which we want to address, but what the President asked us to do and the Speaker said he would do and the Speaker has not done. And that is to address in a rational way, in a way that can get the majority of votes. The two bills they brought to the floor, they knew they couldn't get the votes. The farm bill that he just talked about is going to the Senate. It is dead on arrival. He knows it, Mr. Speaker. The 69 times they tried to uh, repeal the Affordable Care Act, wasted time. He knows it. And he mentions, by the way, how bipartisan this Congress is. Let me tell you why it's bipartisan. We don't control it. But we cooperate when we can. When we were in charge, it wasn't nearly as bipartisan because the Republicans did not cooperate when they could. And he talks about fiscal bills. 90% of the fiscal bills could not have passed this House, kept the government open, opened the government up, give relief to those uh, uh, who were suffering from natural disasters without substantial Democratic help, and in many instances with the majority of Democrats and the minority of Republicans. But the answer I looked for, Mr. Speaker, what are we going to consider next week in terms of an issue that the Speaker said some eight months ago we were going to solve and promised us on February of 18 he was going to address to solve DACA. And now we have this crisis in the country created by the President of the United States with children being wrenched from the arms of their moms and dads. That's what we ought to be discussing. And the majority of leaders are is a good friend of the President's. I understand that. All the President has to do is pick up the phone and call and say to the Attorney General and the Secretary of Department of Health and Homeland Security, stop wrenching those children from the hands of their parents. We don't need legislation. But now we have legislation. I would ask him if he would bring the Nadler bill to the floor, which will prevent children from being wrenched from the hands of their families simply because they've committed a misdemeanor of wanting to seek opportunity in the land of opportunity that we call America. Uh, we'll conclude now. Uh, I don't get a response? But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yield to my friend for his response, of course. Uh, but we need to know what is going to be considered uh, next week. Uh, apparently they haven't decided, and so the majority leader says they'll let us know as soon as uh, they've decided what they're going to do, uh, who they have to deal with to get the uh, cobble the votes together on their side of the aisle, when we have 240 plus votes for an option. But they are being muzzled. They are being prevented to express the will of this House. And I asked the majority leader, does he believe that my representation, that Heard Aguilar has 240 votes on this floor, is inaccurate? And I yield to my friend. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Speaker, my friend made a lot of points. Sometimes facts get caught up in them. So, Mr. Speaker, the gentleman talked about the floor and the willingness of this side to allow Democrat amendments or bipartisanship. As of June 7th, Republicans in the 115th Congress, and we're not done with this Congress yet, have provided for the consideration of over 1,200 amendments on the House floor. Now that includes 570 Democrat amendments. And I don't want to compare apples to oranges, so let's do apples to apples. So in the entire 111th Congress, that was their entire Congress, when my friend was majority leader and Speaker Pelosi allowed less than 1,000 amendments to be considered on the floor. Now, despite the unified Democrat opposition, Republicans are still getting the work done, and we'll continue to do that.
Now, my friend made a few statements, said there's things I did not say. Maybe there were some things I did not say about the economy, but they're different than what he would because there's some really good news. And it's not far from here. Mr. Speaker, you could go to my friend's district. Each of the counties that make up Maryland's 5th Congressional District has seen a drop in unemployment since 2016. St. Mary's County is down over a full percent to 3.7. Calvert County down to 3.5. Charles County down to 3.8. Prince George is down to 4.1. And Anne Arundel County down to 3.2%. <laughs> Now, the other point I did not make, and I thank the gentleman for bringing it up to me, that I missed points. Do you realize in America today, if you are African American, this is the lowest unemployment has ever been. If you're Hispanic, the lowest it has ever been. Yeah, there's things we had to do on our own. But the numbers prove it's worth it. And what's even more telling about this, and something that makes me prouder, it doesn't just help Republican districts, it helps everybody's districts. It helps all Americans, and that's what we're here for. My gentleman brought up that there are issues. Yeah, there are. That's why we want to pass the immigration bill. We think there should be a border, and the border should be protected. We think children should be with their parents, and that's what we're working on. So I look forward to next week, us passing an immigration bill that solves a lot of these problems. And Mr. Speaker, I hope my friend from the other side of the aisle could look at the bill and understand not everybody gets what they want because in that bill, it won't be everything that I want. It won't be, not on one person in this room be everything they want. But will America be safer? Will America be better in the future? And will we have a system that works? That answer will be yes. And that's how I'll cast my vote. I yield back. Mr. Speaker, we'll close now. Neither of the questions that I posed were answered. And certainly the fact that there are 240 votes on this floor was not disputed by the majority leader for the Heard Aguilar, which addresses security at the border. By the way, co-sponsored by Mr. Heard, a member of the majority leader's party a member from Texas who knows about the border and who, I presume, wants to keep it secure. The bill he has co-sponsored has at least 240 votes on this floor. This is the most closed Congress in which I have served, the most closed rules. That's the fact. And apparently, it is closed to the majority who want to move ahead on a bill and just have the opportunity to vote on it and to give the speaker the opportunity to put something on the floor and have the House consider it. And have Ms. Roy Bell Allard and Ms. Rose Leighton, Republican from Florida, have a bill on the floor and have it considered. And have Mr. Goodlatte who did, in fact, have his bill on the floor, and they lost. So, Mr. Speaker, I regret that I don't know what there's going to be next week, because we need to take action. And we need to take action not by compromising with one side of the aisle, and see only capitulation by some. We do need compromise. We do need action. And we need action that can pass the Senate. And uh, I will yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. What purpose is the gentleman from California seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that when the House adjourns today, it adjourn to meet on Monday, June 25, 2018, when it shall convene at noon for morning hour debate and 2 p.m. for legislative business. Without objection.
The chair will now entertain requests for one minute speeches. For purposes, gentlemen from Minnesota, seek recognition. So a little taste of the House floor today, guys, this morning. Still that debate on immigration continues. We're going to switch it up a little bit. You can see, first of all, the background behind me. Check out the White House. Well, you can see the White House a little bit. I'm going to make that a little cl more clear for you. Check out the rain. It's really coming down here in D.C. But using that as our background, we're back in the newsroom here. And in the lower left of your screen, switching it up, we're going down to Florida. Sandra Marco Rubio is going to be touring that Homestead Migrant Facility. Now, if you remember on Tuesday, Senator Bill Nelson was planning on doing the same thing, but he was actually not granted a tour. He was stopped by Health and Human Service officials. Um, he and Representative <clears throat> Debbie Wasserman Schultz were uh, slated to go do that, and they were stopped actually on the scene. Uh, they require more of a notice, I believe a two-week notice, for them to open those facilities to visitation. So they are going to be doing so on Saturday. But today, apparently, Senator Rubio is getting his shot at visiting some of these migrant children who are being held there. Thank and he's also going to uh, provide a few words uh, <clears throat> to the press after he does so. So we're going to make sure we check in to that. Uh, just hearing that that's coming up next. It's going to take a few questions before going in for that tour. The source is Fox. You can stream it. It's on Channel 2. All right, guys, so while we wait for this, we are going to bring this up when this comes up. I do want to hear his remarks before going to see some of these children who are being held in this facility in Florida. But those same House Democrats that you just saw on the floor talking immigration have meandered their way over to talk about uh, the six-month anniversary of the GOP's tax bill, which occurred six months ago, obviously, cutting taxes in a large way for corporations. And uh, they're speaking about that anniversary and um, their 
feelings on this tax cut bill, which debuted six months ago. So we're going to go over there and then bring you back to Florida in just a moment. The parents. Uh, we are here uh, today because it is the six months anniversary of the tax bill. Six months ago, Republicans passed a hastily written tax law that added $1.8 trillion to the deficit in order to give massive tax breaks to the wealthiest in, in our country. It came to the floor without hearings, no witnesses, no testimony, and frankly, without proofreading. It will cause taxes to go up for 86 million middle-class Americans and gives 83% of its benefits to the top 1%. Said another way, uh, the bottom 90, 99% got 17% of the resources. And six months after its enactment, none of the promises that Republicans made are coming to fruition. Contrary to what the majority leader tried to say on the floor today, Republicans promised that American workers would receive a $4,000 wage raise, but wages are falling. They said that the families struggling from paycheck to paycheck would see real relief, and then they up their health care costs very substantially, obliterating any increase that they had gotten. They promised that companies would use their tax cuts to hire more workers and raise wages. But many companies are laying off workers, and many more are using their tax cuts to enrich investors, to buy back uh, stocks. House Republicans said all Americans would be better off. But six months later, we know that's not true for many, many middle-class Americans. Today, we are joined by small business owners, a, a small business owner who will discuss how the law has created more uncertainty and complexity for his business. We'll hear from a mom who is facing the prospect of skyrocketing health insurance premiums as a direct result of the law, the tax law, which uh, eliminated the mandate and assured that 13 million people would lose their insurance, but that 100% of insurance payers would pay higher premiums. We're joined also by a Medicare recipient who is concerned, uh, correctly so, how the tax law will put at risk seniors' access to doctors and care. That's why, as more time passes and Americans learn what's in this law, the more unpopular it becomes. What's the proof of the pudding? Connor Lamb won a district won by uh, President Trump by 20 points. And he was elected, and he campaigned on two major issues, three, really, jobs, making sure that his folks had jobs. Uh, two, uh, make sure that his people had availability to affordable, accessible health care. And three, uh, saying that the tax law was not for them, didn't help them. He won on all three of those issues. That's why, as I said, each day that goes by, uh, the law becomes less popular as people know more about it. Democrats will continue to hold Republicans accountable for their vote to raise taxes on middle-class families kick millions off their health coverage, and make the tax code more and more and more confusing. Their mantra was that they were going to simplify it. They did not do that. So now I'm pleased to uh, yield to uh, the leader uh, of the Democratic Party in the House of Representatives who's been such a strong advocate for jobs, a critical advocate for health care for all Americans, and a strong proponent of a fair tax system for every American, not just the 1%, Nancy Pelosi. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hoyer, uh, for the clarity of your message pointing out uh, the lack of fairness in the Republican tax scam, the lack of openness in the process in which they wrote the bill, 
and the lack of delivering on promises uh, to workers uh, that the Republicans promised and the president promised but did not deliver. You have been a champion on deficit reduction, on fiscal responsibility, and this tax plan, in addition to all of the other things that you said, uh, again, uh, increases the national debt by over $2 trillion when you include interest on the debt. And that's one of the things I want to talk about. That is to say, because of this dark cloud of increasing the national debt, they have to pay for it someplace. So where are they going? In their budget now and in the president's budget, a trillion and a half dollars from Medicaid, affecting our seniors, our children, uh, our, uh, our veterans, et cetera. A half a trillion dollars out of Medicare, funds coming out of education, food stamps, and the rest, but affecting Medicare and Medicaid, Social Security, disability benefits very directly. Why? To give a tax break to the high end. Thank you for pointing out the unfairness of it all, uh, Mr. Hoyer. In addition to that, I think it's very important to note that the tax scam when it removed, it repealed uh, the individual mandate. It is something devastating. Millions of people could lose their health insurance, but over 100 million people could lose their benefit to a pre-existing medical condition opportunity. And the Affordable Care Act, no longer having a pre-existing condition, is a barrier to affordable care, to getting insurance. What they're doing now under this tax bill, gave them the predicate to go to court to sue attorneys general from around, Republican attorneys general from around the country, to sue in court to do away from the benefit of pre existing condition. Horrible to over 125 million families in our country. Just think of it. Any one of us is a phone call away from a diagnosis an accident, a change in our lives, a baby born with a heart defect, pre-existing condition forever, possibly barred from health, affordable health care, access to health insurance, a, child, a family member in an accident, a diagnosis of cancer. All of this horrible in terms of health, but also debilitating in terms of economic security. Most families that declare bankruptcy before the Affordable Care Act, it was because of medical expenses. So this, what they did with this tax scam was not only, as it very clearly said, unfair, unwise, and again, not delivering on its promise, increase the debt, therefore seniors and people with disabilities, et cetera, are paying for it, and now they want to say, to 125 to 30 million families, the federal government is no longer going to defend the law of the land in court. We're going to let the attorneys general's case <laughs> prevail. And by the way, we join them in saying this should be overturned. What a scandal. What a scandal. You have to wonder about it. And again, when we talk about Medicare and Medicaid, we're largely talking about our seniors when we're talking about pre-existing conditions, we are too. And a person in the Congress who has, nobody has done more in terms of the fight uh, for our seniors in terms of Medicare, Medicare, Social Security, the list goes on, including our veterans and all of that mix. And Congressman Jan Schakowsky, I'm pleased to yield to. And as I do so, let us applaud Mr. Hoyer once again for his leadership in all of this. Thank you. And welcome, Congresswoman Schakowsky. Thank you. Well, first, let me say thank you so much to my good friend, Steny Hoyer, our whip, and of course to Leader Pelosi for organizing this press conference and leading the fight against the GOP tax scam. Now, in between uh, thanking our Speaker of the House and introducing our next speaker um, for the uh, press conference, I want to just tell you a little about, bit about my day yesterday. I spent most of that day yesterday in the House Budget Committee marking up the Republican fiscal year 2019 budget. 
Now, the seats in the budget committee are in a U-shape. So for the better part of the last two days, I was looking right into the eyes of my Republican colleagues as they tried to justify what can only be called a truly cruel budget that includes massive cuts to treasured programs like Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, all to pay for the $2 trillion tax gift that they gave to the wealthiest millionaires and billionaires and, uh, and, and huge corporations that offshore, uh, offshore our jobs. This is no accident. This is a plan. This is what they have wanted to do to decimate these, what they call entitlement programs, and frankly, what we like to call earned benefits. I watched my Republican colleagues try to justify why their budget proposal, taking $537 billion from Medicaid, Medicare over the next 10 years, among other things, um, uh, and among other things, suggesting to raise the age of eligibility, even though, by the way, people in the United States, especially men, are not living longer. Maybe Republican colleagues don't have the same type of constituents I do, seniors and older Americans who call my office, sometimes in tears, wondering how they will afford their prescription drugs or basic necessities. Or maybe, just maybe, they have these constituents, but they just don't care. Here to shed more light on just how devastating the Republican cuts to Medicare and Social Security could be is John Glazer. John is 79 years old and uh, happily retired. He's a graduate of C Cornell University and has a master's degree in social work and business administration. He was a community organizer in low-income income communities here and abroad, including several years living and working in Haiti and in Poland. And in recent years, he has been a volunteer for the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. Let's welcome John. Thank you, Congresswoman Chankowski. If you guys are just joining us on our stream, we are streaming uh, House Democrats responding to it being the six month anniversary since that GOP tax cut bill, which cut taxes for large corporations, um, among other things. And they're reacting to that and speaking on that. You just saw House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi speak, as well as um, uh, Representative Hoyer as well earlier in the day. They were on the House floor talking about immigration. So a lot of different things going on in the House today. Meanwhile, guys, we're going to be flipping in a second over to Florida. This is a live look down there where um, Marco Rubio, Senator Marco Rubio, is going to be speaking ahead of touring one of those migrant facilities housing some of those immigrant children down in Florida. That's in Homestead, Florida specifically. Later in the afternoon, in just about a half hour or so, we are going to be having our little medical segment with Dr. Shilpi. She'll be Skyping in with us to talk about some of the hot trending health topics for summer. So make sure you stay on with us for that. But uh, for now, listen, guys, we're going to go back to uh, this conference with some of the House Democrats. This is not how I want for my America. This is not the America I want for my children and grandchildren nor should any of us. It is not the American that millions have paid the ultimate sacrifice to preserve and save since our nation was born. Alexander Hamilton, who, as you know, whose life is currently being portrayed on stage here in Washington, got it right 230 years ago in his speech to the Continental Congress on June 29th, 1787. He said there can be no truer principle than this, that every individual of the community at large has an equal right for, to, uh, equal right to the protection of the government. This tax law clearly fails that standard. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was very eloquently stated. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Raul Ruiz. I represent the 36th Congressional District in Southern California. Thank you to Whip Hoyer for the press conference, the invitation to speak. Thank you, Leader Pelosi, for your leadership. Listen, when I practice in the emergency department and I see patients, uh, they have two things in mind. One is, am I going to be okay? 
And two is, how much is this going to cost? Those are very two fundamental questions that my patients ask, and not only mine, but they ask doctors all across America. And it is so very unfortunate that now premiums are skyrocketing, are skyrocketing incredibly out of control. And it is so incredibly obvious why they're skyrocketing. They're skyrocketing for the changes that Senator Marco Rubio did to the risk corridor. They are skyrocketing because of the constant threat and now the repeal of cost-sharing reductions. They are uh, skyrocketing because of the lack of effort to include more uh, people into the insurance pool to reduce insurance uh, health risks uh, in order to make it more affordable for everyone. And they're skyrocketing because of this tax bill, which increases premiums, which allows the attorney generals to sue for the pre-existing condition protections. And they're trying to repeal that, which means that more people are going to lose insurance and more people are going to have to pay out of pocket. And why do I say obvious? Well, it doesn't take a, 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 a engineer or, or, a, or a rocket uh, scientist to figure it out because the health insurance companies said this themselves. They said if you eliminate the cost-sharing reduction subsidies that help families pay for their bill at point of care, we will have to increase the, uh, the premiums. If you eliminate these other programs that I had mentioned, then we're going to have to increase this premium. So the tax bill has also thrown our health care system into turmoil. The latest estimate from the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office is that as a result of the Republican tax bill, premiums will rise by an average of 10% next year and in some places 40%. They also estimated that the Republican tax bill will contribute to 3 million people next year alone losing health insurance coverage, harming hardworking families. It means more pain, more suffering, shorter lifespans for these individuals who go without care because they can no longer afford it. It means that emergency rooms will be busier. It means financial ruin for young families or those ready to retire. All this, all of this, all of this to give 1.5 billion tax cut to the wealthiest 1% who have their own pristine health insurance and health care access. fighting to keep their majorities in the midterms don't think a law that separates border crossing kids and their parents the way wait until pressure builds this runway of new york's found out yesterday and if this is so Republicans in Congress fighting to keep to the point that President Trump takes action there are so many obstacles to legislation and when the president can do it with his own pen most vulnerable our insurance company said he had a pre-existing condition and refused to cover him pre-existing to what his birth, when that didn't work, 
They then began to raise our insurance premiums every six months. So that by 1991, the year he had to have his second surgery, we were paying $1,750 a month with a high deductible. This idea that high risk pools will help They won't. I've been there. Now, the thing is, is that luckily my husband was able to get a job with a company that provided affordable health insurance without a pre-existing condition exclusion, and our son was able to get his uh, surgery and his life was saved. Um, according, as, a, as a result of the ACA, though, our son was able to stay on his father's insurance until he was 26. And since then, he's 30 now, since then he's be able to get affordable health care again through the ACA. But what I'm concerned about is that the Republican tax scam is going to undermine his ability to get coverage. First, because they're going to make premiums go way up. And secondly, because the refusal by the Department of Justice to defend the ACA in court it's going to mean that people like my son won't be able to get insurance because they have a pre-existing condition. The cost of health insurance for many middle-class families who love their children, just like we love Adam, is going to skyrocket. And citizens, just like our son, aren't going to be able to get insurance at all. And I really want to know, why is it that the Republicans care more about protecting huge profits for insurance companies than they do about protecting insurance for their citizens? For your job, Republicans, is to represent all of your constituents, not just the wealthiest. And so my family needs that our um, representative, Rob Whitman, we need him to do his job and represent us and not the insurance companies. We need to be able to rely on the fact that people like our son Adam, who we love, and who and others like him who their parents love, are going to be able to get affordable health care because nobody should have to worry about how they're going to pay their health insurance premiums when their child is fighting for their life. Thank you. Donna, thank you for those comments that really represent the voices of mothers and indeed parents all over our country. My name is Donald McEachin, and I have the privilege of representing Virginia's 4th Congressional District. And I want to begin by thanking Leader Pelosi and Whip Hoyer for the leadership that both of you all have shown on this issue. The GOP tax bill helped large multinational corporations and their wealthiest investors at the expense of hardworking Americans. It rewarded off offshoring, created new loopholes for special interests, and will ultimately mean higher taxes for tens of millions of American families. Meanwhile, small business owners are faced with increasing complexity, the loss of deductions, and other changes that create immense uncertainty. I used to be one. I can tell you these folks cannot afford the kind of expensive tax attorneys who are helping major corporations navigate and profit from the law's many changes. That makes it harder to compete. The playing field is most assuredly tilted against them. You know, as a former small business owner, I was responsible for my employees. I was responsible for ensuring that they got their paychecks on time and ensuring that they got good quality health insurance. Small business owners have many such responsibilities, and this tax plan makes it more difficult for them. Small business owners are the backbone of this economy. We should be helping and not hurting them. My fellow Virginian, Munir Beg, is a small business owner himself. He knows firsthand how the Republican tax scam is damaging small businesses and, the, and hurting the middle class. He is a founder and CEO of a small business that advises clients on IT strategy, cybersecurity, and risk management, both in the U.S. and abroad. And so I would like to invite him to come up and share a few words with you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Congressman Leadership, for this event. And 
I want to say that, you know, six months ago, we had a tax cut, tax uh, cut and jobs act that was passed. At least that's what we were told that uh, it was a tax act and jobs cut. I have a different opinion on it. Uh, I will say it was a tax act to cut jobs. So, because if you look at what's happening as a result of it, it's not helping anybody except those top one person. What happens to the rest of the America? Uh, my question to our officials who passed this bill is, if this was a small business or middle class tax act to help them, why are the benefits or the deductions that are for the small business and the middle class in there expiring, whereas the corporate benefits are permanent? Why have you taken some of the deductions away that a small business used to take, such as you know, interest deductions, where, you know, new market tax credits, or uh, entertainment expenses, or you know, looking for other things? What, either some of these have been completely repealed, or they've been gutted significantly. Who does it impact? It doesn't impact a large C corporation. It impacts a corporation like me. Somebody who has to basically look at every single piece of the puzzle and say, okay, how do I put these pieces together at the end of the day and make my business go to the next year and the next year and hopefully someday I will grow. The bill is anything but a tax cut and a jobs creation. It's designed to, uh, designed to help small businesses and middle class. It is a return on investment for those hefty donors by the Republican Party. Simple as that. A small business... <coughs> under current law, can expense up to $500,000 for qualifying property. Under the new law, it's $5 million. Uh, what is interesting in here is, if you look at the SPS Small Business Administration's report, an average small business owner makes $50,000 a year. Now, for an average small business owner to avail that $5 million investment, that's 100 years of saving without spending a penny. That is, if he or she lives that extra 100 years, because he's not going to start the business right after he's born or she's born. There's going to be some time in between. I don't know if anybody's living 130, 150 nowadays. Uh, so if you look at that, then another, another piece of the puzzle is that he or she has to live healthy those 100 years. Because we have gutted the healthcare system also, so if God forbid they fall sick, forget it. They're not going to lose that $5 million if they eventually were able to save, but they're going to also lose everything else they might have with it. Let's be re real and look beyond the smoke screen of these constant lies, deceptions, and alternate facts. Small business, the economic engine of our nation, represents 99.9% .9 of firms, employing 60 million people, generating 33% of our nation's export value, and what they have gotten in reward is a very complex bill which IRS has still not put out the rules how to implement. But how is IRS going to put it? Because the people who wrote it don't even know what they wrote in it. We have people coming out now that the, we, we voted for the bill. Well, I didn't know what was in it. Well, if you didn't know what was in it, what were you elected for? This is not a selection committee here. We are not selected to do what we want to do. We are elected to do what the people that elected you to do is required to do. By the way, quick question. How many of us know that the battery of the debt clock has been stolen? Because it stopped on January when Trump was, uh, you know, brought into office. It stopped ticking. Till then, for the last eight years, for every bill that was put in the House or the Senate, the only question was raised, well, it's going to increase the debt. We've got to cut somewhere. What happened to the debt clock? What happened to the batteries? Do we need to bring China, Chinese batteries to reinstall on it? Like we need to get something, you know, uh, some things need to be fixed here. I, as a small business and many millions of others like me, don't have the resources needed to decode this complex tax code. If I have to, my accountant, who is a small business also, he has limited capabilities also. So he has to basically hire a consultant to tell him how to decipher the tax code, which is going to increase the cost for me. Am I paying more or am I getting more? My answer is I'm paying more. The question remains, are we able to understand the law? The people who wrote don't know it. So how am I supposed to wrote it, know it? We spent last eight years trying to repeal the Obamacare or American Affordable Care Act, a bill that was helping millions. 
Why do we still have the bill that's hurting millions on the books? Repeal it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, bottom line, no hearings, no witnesses, uh, and 1% of the American people very substantially advantaged, and 99% uh, got the leftovers. Uh, that's not what Paul Ryan said on the floor. What Paul Ryan said on the floor, the average family, 59,000, a family of four, uh, they were the people he wanted to help. He didn't do it. The Congress didn't do it. Uh, they're the people we should have helped. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, and for letting us know the personal uh, challenges that uh, this bill uh, confronted you with. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Look, there had been a number of proposals, but the answer to that is uh, our objective right now is to take back the House. And when we take back the House, we are, are going to uh, address responsible ways to move forward to fund things, avoid putting future generations in the deepest of debt, uh, invest in, in, our, in jobs, growing our economy, and making sure people have the skills uh, to take the jobs that are available in the 21st century. But the answer to your question is, while there are some bills who have suggested uh, alternatives uh, with respect to the tax uh, procedures, well, we do not have a comprehensive bill at this point to do that, uh, but uh, it will uh, be addressed when and if the American public decide, as they apparently are uh, projected to do, is to uh, return control of the House uh, to us. I might observe that the last time we had four years of balanced budget was when um, President Clinton was to President of the United States. We think we need to return to that era. Yes. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, um, and if I do mind you asking, uh, I don't have to answer it. Is that the? <laughs> um, but the president has said it's now to make it a temporary fix, but ultimately it's up to Congress to do a permanent fix, both on DACA and now with the children. Oh, no, that's not true. There is a consensus bill. It's Heard Aguilar. Uh, it had uh, 216 signatures to ask it to be brought to the committee. It needed 218. It had two Republicans who were prepared to sign on until, uh, in my view, the Speaker uh, twisted their arm and said uh, there was going to be this compromise. The compromise that was reached was not a compromise, it was a capitulation by those who support DREAMers and who said they were going to support them, uh, who capitulated to a bill that would not have done that, uh, which uh, one of the think tanks says 12% of the DREAMers may have gotten citizenship some 23 years from now. That was not a compromise. That was a capitulation. Uh, there is a bipartisan bill. And I just said on the floor, and I challenged the majority leader, I said there are 240 votes. You need 218. 240 votes uh, for the Heard Aguilar bill. Bring it to the floor. And Mr. Majority Leader, do you deny that it would get 240 votes at least? And he did not. So uh, that's a compromise uh, bill. I think there's some 50 Republicans plus that would vote for that and every Democrat would vote for that. There is no other really bipartisan bill. The Goodlatte bill was brought to the floor, reported out of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, Republican, they put that on the floor. It didn't get the majority of the votes. So that what they did was they put a bill on that they knew would not pass and refused to put a bill on that they know will pass. Uh, so uh, we're going to continue to work, but I urge the majority leader... Bring that to the floor if you don't think it uh, is the good policy uh, and you can argue that and people will vote against it, it will fail. On the other hand, if people think it's good policy and it passes, have the courage to give the People's House an opportunity to vote on it. Yes.
First of all, let's think about what the president has said. He is taking infant children hostage, wrenching them from the arms of their parents, traumatizing them, perhaps for life, for the purposes of forcing uh, us, apparently, uh, to make an agreement that we think is bad for dreamers, bad for our immigration system, which needs to be fixed, and not reflective of the American people's uh, priorities. Let me read to you a quote. The administration's current family separation policy, as you pointed out, taking children hostage, wrenching them from their family's arms, the administration's current family separation is an affront to the decency of the American people and contrary to principles and values upon which our nation was founded. That is not just another person. That happens to be a Republican, but not just any Republican. That quote comes from a former candidate for president of the United States, in the Republican uh, Party, John McCain, who knows something about decency, knows something about being incarcerated, and knows full well that the policies being pursued by the president are inconsistent with the American principles. Look, uh, the border wall, if, if these children are being damaged so that he can win a proposition on a border wall, which so many of his Republicans think will not solve the problem. We are for border security. We don't think the border wall uh, is a good solution. And he wants to come up with $25 billion on the table. And if it's not all spent, then the DACA uh, protectees would not be protected. That's bad policy, it's bad uh, uh, ethics, uh, and it's bad uh, uh, policy in terms of the American people. So uh, we, we hope that we can get to a solution that both sides can agree to, uh, as the president asked us to do eight months ago. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here.
All right, guys, thanks for uh, bearing with us now. We're back in the newsroom uh, for the health segment portion of our show, just a little medical segment that we wanted to push towards the end of our stream here at 1.30 Eastern Time. And joining us now, as we usually do, is Dr. Shilpi Agarwal. Shilpi, can you hear me? I can. can you awesome. Hear me? Yeah, we got your voice. Awesome. Great. Okay, great. Um, Perfect. Can you see me? We're good. Yes, we can see you. Okay. We can hear you. Let's talk. I'm so glad to have you back. First of all, you been? Were you away for a little bit? You were. Yeah, we took a family trip. It was fun. Awesome. Okay, so great. So we're heading into summer. Obviously, summer, uh, summer solstice yesterday. Very exciting. The longest yeah. day. What, there's so many summer trends and stuff coming out uh, recently as far as taking care of ourselves health wise in the summer. Um, let's talk about some of that. Like. There's, there's a new thing with sunscreen, right? We were going to talk about this. Yeah, and so you were saying that there is a new gummy vitamin out, or I should say a gummy sun protectant that is designed to really help to augment your sun protection routine. And so I have it here. I don't know if you guys oh, can cool. see it. It's called Sun Dots, and um, it is made with the primary ingredient being something called polypodium leucotomus, and that's a mouthful. But essentially, it's a fern plant extract that comes from Central America. Mm -hmm. And the um, studies, if you look at all of them, are that when patients took this, in addition to using regular topical, the cream sunscreen, it did pr protect them and prevent them from sunburns, um, you know, did a better job with that. So it's really, really good in terms of using, especially if you're one of those people who has sun sensitive skin. So either you've had a sunburn in the past that's really bad, you've ever been diagnosed with a skin cancer in the past, or you just have that very fair skin profile that tends to burn easily. That being said, this isn't a replacement for your sunscreen. Just remember that, you guys. So if you see any products marketed that are saying, just take this vitamin and then you don't need sunscreen, that's not at all true. It's simply that it's an additive benefit and it really does protect deep down. The good news about this is that it can work right away. So instantaneously, they promise the benefit that should you start taking it today, mm -hmm. put on your sunscreen and this weekend, you know, you're going to the pool, you should get sun protection benefit. It's not that it takes weeks and weeks to kick in. So interesting. Is that a swallowable pill or is it, what is it exactly? It's actually a gummy and oh, um, right. it looks like this so and um, it doesn't taste bad. You know, it, it doesn't taste like candy, but it, it's definitely palatable, and I think that's also the goal with now we have so many gummy vitamins and things like that. But yeah. um, it's an interesting product. It's a little bit expensive, I so ask, yeah. um, I think that if, as I said, if you're in that group that's really high risk trying to protect yourself, or you want to maybe use it because you're going to a high sun exposed area, mm. a trip or something like that, I think this is a great augment to that. Ideally, it's designed to be used every single day for sun protection, but in some ways that might be cost prohibitive. So it's called Sun Dots. You can take a look at that. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I think it is really good for those people that have had multiple burns, multiple skin cancers, because they need to do everything they can to protect themselves. For the common person, we really need to just make sure that we're applying our sunscreen properly. And when we are looking for sunscreen, make sure you guys are using something that is mineral based. So it should have zinc oxide in it. Mm. And that's because that creates a complete barrier as opposed to those chemical ones that might say avobenzone or oxybenzone. Okay. So zinc oxide and is what you so want. Many choices, right? When you go to the the store, you're, there's 50 choices for sunscreen. So my best advice to you is always, if there's something that just says for babies, use that because mm -hmm. that is one that is highest in potency and best in terms of coverage. Would you say, and so you're saying, this is so interesting to me, it's an augmenting to wearing sunscreen for these these gummies or these pills mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, someone who maybe isn't really prone to sunburn but still wears suntan lotion, and like you and I are a little darker, maybe not as fair, is that still gonna augment right. our reaction to the sun or? It is, no matter what, and I'm glad you brought that up, Molly, because there is kind of this big myth that people of my skin tone or darker skin tones, we don't we don't get burned as easily, we don't have that um, predisposition to skin cancers, mm -hmm. but I think that's a big myth. And the reality, we are the population where they're actually detected later because we think mm -hmm. we're immune and you know we can get these basal cells, melanomas, all of that. So nobody is really above wearing sunscreen. And now they've made a lot of tinted versions too so that it rubs in better. Okay, really interesting. And how expensive is it? You said it is kind of expensive. 
Um, I believe it's thirty or four. I'm, I'm gonna check on the price, but I, I, I think one bottle, which contains thirty six gummies, okay. is upwards of thirty some dollars. Interesting. I'm really yeah. intrigued by it. I definitely want to look into it a little more. And it's cool. If you guys have questions, by the way, let us know in the live chat if you have anything you want us to relay to Dr. Shilpi. But it is really interesting coming into summer. It's important to know this what ingredient you need in your sunscreen. It's really important to wear it daily, right, on your face and to have some sort of base lotion that has it. Exactly. You need it daily. And people think that well, it's a cloudy day outside. Those are the most dangerous days, actually, because you're still getting that UVA, mm. UVB light through. But we're fooled because we think if the sun's not shining, it's not there. But mm -hmm. it is. Um, I'm trying to look up the price for you guys, but um, let's see. Shop. And a one-time purchase is $50 for the one bottle. Okay. If you get it monthly, it's $30. So Interesting. So they're trying to get people I'm to kind of subscribe to it, to do it. Exactly, similar to just a multivitamin, and it would be additive to that. Um, it does, you know, protect against UVA and UVB. It's something that I think um, is worth trying, certainly, but it's not going to replace your sunscreen, your sun protective clothing. Yeah. Are we? Do you think we're getting to a place where, I mean, is medicine moving in that direction where something might replace it or no? I mean, that's, that's just intriguing to me. Because I think so much of... Um, skin cancers, sun exposure burns, at the end of the day have to do with surface area and the sun shining down on you, the UVA and UVB rays penetrating and affecting you. Mm -hmm. While we do want to do stuff from the inside out, um, everybody's inside out is slightly different, so I think it would be hard for me to see the future of completely having a pill replace topical. Um, I think we're getting more towards things that create much better benefits, so like an added thing, but I think it would be tough to completely say there's going to be a point where we don't need sunscreen. Yeah, totally. Really interesting. While well, going into the summer months, changing topics yeah. a little bit, another thing that's been really big and trending in the news is uh, the effects of video gaming or video game addiction, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I was reading this this week, and we were talking about it today and in, in this last week in our meetings. Um, the World Health Organization actually came out and said this is a mental health problem. It's a disorder. Um, you know, we're going to name it as such, and it's a big deal. We, we see people young and old kind of holding themselves in and making this a huge part of their lives. What is your sort of medical, I guess, doctor take on this, and yeah. what should we be doing about it? Yeah, so I thought it was really interesting, and it was Monday, I think, the World Health Organization said that they were going to classify this as a true disorder, and... Um, you know, it's it's met with kind of a little bit of pushback. These different organizations are saying, well, we don't really have enough data to show that this is a true disorder. But to me, I think it really highlights um, an important thing we need to talk about as society and, and medically and health-wise that there is an addictive component to any use of technology, especially now because we have our mm -hmm. phones, we have say. Phones everywhere. Use, we have all these different modality is where we're digesting information coming at us and mm -hmm. it's making it very hard for people. Um, if you look at kind of the, um, I was looking at one of the studies and it said that true gaming disorder, what they outlined within that, it says, um, you know, fractured connections to your friends and family. If you're younger, impaired academics, or if you're in school, you have an indifference to other areas of your life for greater than 12 months. Well, I think that if we just use that alone, that's a very small set of subset of people, but so many of us get addicted to our technology, right? Because it's our way to connect with people, it's way to get information, and it's just so prevalent now. Um, but a lot of health professionals, and myself included, are kind of looking at it as, this is a great way to open up the conversation about addiction to technology okay. and look at some of the signs, figure out some of the signs. So for you guys, I would say if you feel very anxious without having your phone or device with you, if you feel that you can get lost and completely use that technology for hours on end without drinking water or going to the bathroom, getting up to eat stuff, those are problematic things and can be addressed and we have ways to help you because we treat them just like any other addiction. And if mm -hmm. you look at the brain and the way the brain is working when these people are addicted, it's very similar to drug use and nicotine addiction. And all those same centers are being triggered so we can use some of the same 
tips to help you. Um, the other kind of practical thing that I say to people and that I sometimes have been trying to do is figuring out a small block of time. I think an hour is actually a long time, so I say start with 15 minutes. But 15 minutes where you don't have your phone um, and set an alarm, ideally not on your phone, but if, if your phone puts somewhere else and the alarm goes off, for 15 minutes you're gonna do something completely different. Take a walk, you know, read something in paper, on paper, um, or you know, interact with someone human. That's the most important thing. And these social connections is what we're missing out on. And it's kind of shedding light on the fact that a lot of these people suffering from these addictions, something else is going on underlying that's making their addiction so strong. It's a lack of these social connections, a lack of kind of general um, interaction in their daily life. Interesting, I was gonna say, what is really, just to play devil's advocate about it, what is the biggest problem? Is it sort of the lack of interaction with others that's not really a screen or buttons, or is it getting outdoors, or what is, what, if you could pinpoint one, like I guess physically, is there one main issue with it, or is it that those habits become habitual and you do that in other portions of your life? So it's probably everything that you touched on. So mm. specifically, if you look at, for example, mm. men, right? June is Men's Health Month, so I think it's great. I think they're increasingly more sedentary, so they're not up and out walking, spending energy, um, and that's linked to obesity. But I have studies that also shows that a more sedentary lifestyle for men can lead to lower sperm count, depression, you know, lack of other important health benefits. If you're sitting and you're eating, you're also, many of these people are tending to have high caffeine drinks, not as much water. They're having, in the extreme cases that they documented are these gamers who are gaming for 20, 30 hours on end and they don't drink water, they're eating very high sodium processed foods. Mm -hmm. All of those contribute, and then it does become habitual. It becomes normal. They have very poor sleep because they're so stimulated they're grinding their teeth. It's multifactorial. So I don't think it's any one thing, but all of this collectively, constantly being addicted and attached to technology, mm -hmm. certainly has negative health benefits. Yeah. So or negative impacts, I should say. Right. So, so interesting. Um, really all interesting points that you've touched on there. So that's, yeah. I mean, that's been big in the news lately. People are obsessed with Fortnite. You know, you have a lot of your, everybody. Yeah. Age. It doesn't really matter. Maybe some of you guys out there are, uh, playing it, just these addictive games and stuff. It's it's interesting to see um, and to hear from you, kind of the health tip as to how to combat that. Yeah, I mean, my I guess my question would be, and I see patients sometimes saying this that yeah, they're getting headaches or eye strain because mm -hmm. of being on screen too much. But to me, it's also I wonder if there are people who are using um, technology a lot on the computer a lot on YouTube on doing gaming sites. Do you ever feel like there is, you've reached a point where it's enough? I mean, I, I would be interested to get feedback from you guys that, mm -hmm. do you ever feel like, wow, I, I need to step away, I've been on the computer too long, or you know, could people just be on it endlessly? Because then I think if you can identify it, that's one good step, right? Yeah, totally, and it's totally ironic too that we're talking about this obviously on YouTube too, and some of you guys who right. are viewing this, or you, maybe you are clicking around and you do you know, habitually watch things, or. Uh, maybe you make your own creative content or whatever you do, but you definitely are digital users. So really good. That's a really good uh, point, Shilpi, to kind of make. Like if you guys have um, a breaking point or do you know when it's enough or do you know when it's too much, like it would be interesting to pull our audience here for sure. Um, right, because a lot of the parents too that I see that are even talking like my kids, that they're, I'm worried about my kids, I'll see parents saying that the kids don't see it as a problem. So that's a big sign, right? If you don't yeah. see it as a problem, but you spent 15 hours or five hours even straight on the computer, that's a long time. I know, yeah, when you know it's a physical or mental health disorder and when is it is it not, is there a breaking point? It's, it's interesting, it's a little bit muddled there. Um, moving on to our last topic, this is really interesting to me too. You've probably seen this, guys all over social media, maybe Instagram, all in general on the web, and in the celebrity world, let's talk another celebrity trending topic, the keto diet lifestyle. Shilpa, you talked to me about this before right. off camera, and I, because I was interested in it and wanted to know more. Uh -huh. What does it stand for? Where did it come from? And what's it all about? Um, okay, so the keto, that's short term for ketogenic diet. And what it basically is, is that it helps, by eating certain foods, it helps your body promote 
the formation of what are called ketones. So mm-hmm. step back a little bit and to kind of make it easy to understand. When we eat something, traditionally we generally eat mostly carbohydrates, good or bad carbohydrates. But all of those are broken down into our body and they're broken down into little packets of energy. And those energy packets are called glucose, which we've heard a lot about, right? The body needs to use glucose for all the energy for everything that we do. It uses that by secreting a hormone from our pancreas. So that shoots out insulin. And when we use insulin from our pancreas, it basically helps the glucose be utilized in the body. That's that's a typical, like, the normal thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem with that is that if you essentially get too much glucose, it can turn into fat, it can create problems, which we've discussed before. But ketones or the keto diet, what that basically does, and instead of using glucose and carbohydrates for energy, it uses um, ketone bodies. So the liver essentially kind of stores these fatty acids, the fats that we're consuming, breaks those down, and then burns those for energy, and ultimately burns your fat stores for energy. So, you know, this sounds amazing, right? Like mm-hmm. I'm going to burn all the fat in my body. The problem is that while I don't think it's necessarily bad, it's somewhat hard to sustain. So a person that's on the keto diet, basically what they would do is they would be eating a high fat, kind of medium protein, very low carbohydrate diet. So you would be eating eggs, a lot of meats, you know, cheeses, things that are very high, avocado, things that are very, very high in fat, some proteins, but very minimal carbs. And now you have to remember, fruits and vegetables are still carbs, they're high fiber, but you're going to be eating very minimal of that, no bread, pasta, all of that stuff. Minimal, okay, carbs in general, veggies included. Exactly. Um, And so it takes the body about two to three days to completely get rid of all of the glucose and start making those ketones. So it'll take you two, three days to adjust. And then people do see drastic results. You know, I've had patients do this and they've lost 12, 15 pounds in like less than 10, I think 10 days or so. Yeah. Whoa. Um, so I think that it is, th- this is my medical opinion on it. I think that if you have a lot of weight to lose, if you are not diabetic, because this has other implications for people who are diabetic. Okay. Um, and you like eating high fat foods and you you know are not vegetarian or pescatarian so you have much fewer options this is a good way to jump start weight loss so let's say you have 50 pounds to lose this is going to be a good way to see that improvement and maybe fuel that excitement to continue kind of doing something healthy for yourself okay that being said i think it's a really hard thing to sustain and i think that constantly doing this kind of forever and definitely mm-hmm. is really hard because at the end of the day, a varied diet with fruits, with vegetables, with complex carbs, grains is important and it's necessary. So I don't think you can do this forever. I think kind of a modified ketone diet where you're mostly eating proteins, fats, and some good carbs is, is a better option. But, Interesting. Yeah. How does that diet differ from I don't know, I'm trying to think of some of the other big ones that people have used that are very high in protein, maybe high in fats. Are there some similar? So, the, so for example, like people do South Beach diet, mm-hmm. right? And that's in different phases. And it's similar to that. Um, people are doing like paleo as well. Right. Um, and what's really kind of making the keto diet stand out really is the high, high fat content. So there's things online, like if you go to, it's I think called a keto calculator, it can tell you for your own body composition how many calories and how much percentage of fat you should be eating. Okay. It's very high in fat grams and it's extremely low in carbohydrate grams. So that's basically the, the ratio of the amount of fat protein compared to carbs is really the most drastic on keto. Okay. That's what differs and makes it stand out. And then remind yeah. me again, so the high that high fat content does what again to the glucose? Or what how does it change your body? So, so basically when you're giving your body fat instead of carbohydrates, it says, Well, I don't have the glucose to burn for energy, so what am I gonna burn? I'm gonna burn fat. And the way I'm gonna burn that is by making these ketone bodies that the liver kind of helps you to make. And so I think it's great because you do have fat loss after that initial two to three day period. Um it's hard because it's not as sustainable as something where you're eating 
multitude of other foods, you know? Mm. Um, so some people, the biggest complaint I get too is that people get, um, they have GI issues. So I have noticed a lot of patients end up having a lot of constipation um, because they're suddenly having just fat and protein and not enough fiber to push through everything. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the issue of just that they get kind of sick of those same foods. You know, it's like there's only so much that you can eat in terms of steak and eggs if you just okay. missing yeah. out. Um, and there's a there's a kind of right and wrong way to do the ketone diet because I think that people think, oh, high fat, I can eat bacon for every meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mm -hmm. I can eat, you know, steak and I can eat a lot of cheese. And those are not the best foods for you to eat in extremely high quantity. So if it kind of sounds too good to be true, like you shouldn't be eating this breakfast, lunch, and dinner, that's also a signal to me that it's not going to last. And, and when you do consume all that fat, I'm, I'm curious, when you when your body changes to say, hey, we want to burn fat now, isn't that interesting? Because is it not a wash because you're taking in all that fat, but you're also, is that how does that work? So it, it is in some ways, but but essentially the it's converting those fats to be utilized as energy, but then also mobilizing fat that you have because you, have. you need more energy, you need more sort of fat created energy to the, for the body to use, for the brain to use as fuel. So okay. it's kind of harnessing those stores that normally wouldn't be accessed because you're giving the body carbs to access, which is kind of the easy way, Got you know? It. Yeah, interesting um, to break so it down. So the science behind it is really interesting. Mm. Yeah, and we're seeing a lot, right? Kind of in the, in I don't know, people talking about it, celebrities talking about it, even just people who are trying mm. it out. Um, so you would say a modified version of this is better, it's not very sustainable, but um, I mean, is it going yeah, anywhere I mean, soon? Bottom is line, you, you will absolutely see results if you stick to the plan. There are gonna be some side effects. Um, it's not really a long-term solution. It's not really a healthy lifestyle reboot. It's simply kind of a quick fix, right? So if you need a quick fix, if you want to um, see quick weight loss, you'll you'll achieve that with the keto diet. But yeah. in two or three months, if you're not still doing it, will you keep that weight off? Probably not. Yeah, wow, that's fascinating. I was so curious about this because it was just everywhere and I know we were talking about it, but thanks, Shelby, this is great. Thanks for yeah, all that fun. education. The other thing that I was going to say is that one big complaint on the keto diet mm. is that people say they have really bad breath. And I've seen wow. that with patients having like a strong odor because when the body makes all these ketones, there's something, a byproduct called acetone. And so you have kind of a specific odor to the breath of the foods being processed. So be aware of that, be aware of kind of headaches and a little bit of mental fog for the first few days. Mm -hmm. Um, as your body ad adapts. This is a big shift metabolically for your body. Yeah, fascinating. Oh my goodness. Well, this has all been awesome stuff. Thank you so much, Shelby, for joining us in your sure, expertise sure. as always. Um, we'll have Shelby again on. And if you guys have any comments or anything you can relate to on some of these topics, let us know in the comments. Ask us any questions you have. We'll make sure we get them over to Shelby and get some answers for you. Yep, sounds good. All right, thanks, Shelby. We'll see you next all time. All right, have a good weekend. Bye, you too. Bye, bye, guys. All right, guys. Well, thanks so much for joining us here on our stream today, guys. We're live in uh, Fox 5 DC in our newsroom. It is pouring outside. Let me show you a quick live look at the White House, one of our cameras. I didn't realize it was coming down so hard, but what a day. I'm definitely not prepared for this. So if you're in the DMV area, lots of showers going on right now. You can see those foggy skies, but it is bright and sunny down in Florida right now. Democratic senators are on the border um, and they're talking about their visit to uh, the border as all of this immigration um, talk comes out. Actually, scratch that. They are in Texas, not in Florida. We're going to jump down to uh, Tornillo, Texas, uh, where they're making a visit to the border to uh, talk about what's happening down there. So making the switch now. We're not going to be satisfied with this situation until they're reunified with their families. But I mean, they're scared right now. You, you as a parent, you said right. you're a parent. Tell them something. I'll, I'll tell you, you what, we, you that, that the entire American experience right now, that people all across this country are focused on you kids, are thinking about you every single day, and are fighting to reunify you with your family. And that's not just 
a couple of senators from New Mexico and a senator from Connecticut. That is, that is the entirety of the United States. Now, we know that there are people who think that this is good policy, but this is a good country. And the vast majority of Americans are going to fight to see these kids back with their families. What should we call this site? Is this, is this a tent city? Is this an internment camp? Is this a black site? What do we refer to this as? Well, I think it's an internment site with tents. It's a prison-like internment site. And uh, my message to the kids is, you are not alone. The world is watching. Even though you can't talk, even though we can't visit with you, we're watching, the world is watching. We're gonna fight for you. And whatever you call it, it should not exist in America. The, the label is less important than the fact here in one of the greatest states, in the greatest nation, in the United States of America, we have this mass detainment internment camp. When the parents are released from jail, would he be sent here? The parents are deployed. Will this become a family? No, no. In fact, the contractor has told us, I don't know whether we should say this, but say it. Uh, <laughs> well, they, he, he would decline respectfully to turn this camp into, a in family. effect, a family detainment center. It's, it's, and I think that's the, you know, we're both former attorneys general. If you had to pick a piece of evidence to say this policy is headed for a train wreck, it's the fact that the contractor who runs this facility and does it well is saying family detention and internment is a totally different enterprise. And that's why the courts have said you can't do it. It violates rights. Go ahead, one more over there. Just, we'll take one more question. Yeah. One more question. Yeah. Sorry, one more question. Yeah. Why don't you say to the other senators, how do you convince them to join and say this is a terrible policy? Well, I, I think, uh, and I don't mean to any way make it political, but I, I, I think across the board, to even talking to Republican senators, uh, they haven't stood up and, and sponsored much of the legislation, but they believe this is a very bad policy. All of us believe separating children from their families is a bad policy. And, and we're going to stay on top of this. We're, we're going to make sure this administration at every level, as we hold hearings, as we move down the road, that this policy does not continue. and advocate and make sure we don't head for the train wreck, which is interning families in the United States of America uh, in camps. But here, here's one last point. The administration has sabotaged every responsible effort to deal with immigration. We don't have the time to go through the ins and outs, but I think pretty apparently we were on the verge of a solution for the dreamers. Twice we had a deal. Twice. Twice. Totally sabotaged by the president. And the reason why Congress is often failing to act, and it is a failure, is the president has, in effect, criticized every single thing we would do. And so my Republican colleagues, our Republican colleagues, um, have so far not stepped All up. Right, but sorry, we need a bipartisan solution.
on the campaign trail. She's gone around the country advocating for sanctuary cities. So she's giving false hope to these. Republicans in Congress fighting to keep their majorities in the midterms don't think a law that separates border crossing kids and their parents will be a winner for them. I would say that uh, none of this uh, reflects well on Congress or uh, the administration in terms of our inability to solve the problem. If the GOP majority leads the way on a legislative fix, Mitch McConnell believes the midterm impact will be minimal. Well, it's not going to tar anybody. We're going to fix the problem. But the Democratic leaders trying to retake majorities in Congress are not not in a rush to help the party in power pass a new law that ends this crisis. Senator Chuck Schumer seems content to wait until pressure builds to the point that President Trump takes action. There are so many obstacles to legislation, and when the president can do it with his own pen, it makes no sense. That strategy is not going to work for one vulnerable Democrat trying to win re-election in a state President Trump won, Senator Joe Manchin. Well, I'm sorry, I disagree with Chuck, and Chuck knows that. You always negotiate. We're here to fix things. We're not here to make it worse. As this issue really started to boil this weekend, a Quinnipiac poll found that while just 7% of Democratic voters support separating border crossing parents and kids, 24% of independents support the policy, and 55% of Republicans do too. Now, one GOP candidate hoping to challenge Massachusetts Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren this fall believes this issue opens Democrats up to major criticism on the campaign trail. She's gone around the country advocating for sanctuary cities. So she's giving false hope to these families. And so they're making this terrible journey. And so she's giving them the idea that they can find sanctuary in Massachusetts. But a top Democratic surrogate this cycled Senator Cory Booker believes that this issue is too traumatic to be included in talks about flipping seats for now. We shouldn't be talking about that, honestly. This should be, this is a time that we should not be engaging in politics. We should not be thinking about election consequences. A top Trump ally told me tonight they don't expect immigration to be a big issue when the midterms roll around. After all, nobody is talking about the North Korea summit today, and that was just last week. On Capitol Hill, Peter Ducey, Fox News. Parents accused of torturing and holding 12 of their 13 kids captive inside their Paris, California home. And now David and Louise Turpin will be heading to trial on multiple charges of abuse. The Turpins appeared in state superior court for a second day Thursday, both charged with 50 counts, including torture, false imprisonment, child abuse and cruelty to a dependent adult. Judge Bernard Schwartz found probable cause to try them on 49 of those counts. He also described the couple's behavior as sadistic and astounding. The abuse and severe neglect intensified over time. On January 14th, one of their daughters escaped and called 911, reporting the parents' abuse, leading police to the home where children ranging from 2 to 29 years old were filthy, malnourished, and living in squalor. Officers even found some of them chained to their beds. Victims later telling police their parents would beat them and strangle them as punishment. The children's location is unknown at this time, but a lawyer representing seven of them say they are doing well and working to move forward. In addition to the charges they both face for abuse and torture, David Turpin has also been charged with one count of a lewd act on a child under the age of 14 and multiple perjury charges, and Louise Turpin an assault charge. They have pleaded not guilty to all counts and are facing life in prison if convicted. The Turbans are expected back in court on August 3rd for arraignment. Reporting in Washington, D.C., I'm Ellison Barber, Fox News. Shall we toast? Everybody's palate is different. Wine guy Keith Mullen says whatever your flavor, raise it up to good health. The wine lifestyle is a healthy lifestyle. Many will tell you good for your heart. It's in moderation. But you need to recork that bottle. A new study finds each extra glass of wine you drink could take 30 minutes off of your life. It suggests five glasses of wine per week is still in the safe zone. But drinking more than that may shorten your lifespan. This one's kind of a biggie. 600,000 people being studied questioning what is a normal amount of wine. And Dr. Jamin Brombot says the outcome 
not good. So if you drink 10 glasses of wine a week, it's going to cut your life expectancy by almost two years. And if you drink over 17 glasses a week, it's going to reduce it by almost five years. The negatives on your heart health killing the positives in this one, leading many doctors to drastically reconsider this. what this that is, healthy amount is. is. Well, it was. 14 glasses of wine in a week for guys, and then seven for women and the recommendation now says this is all you should be having per week this is what you should be having a week and leave the rest to the side only five per week man or woman and uh no long pours be about that much okay. you see where it's at the widest part of the glass but there is some fine print to the study 600,000 people across 19 countries there's going to be some biases. Different surveys, old records, plus most modern countries have different recommendations. Everything from five a week to two a day. In Belgium, you can even get away with three per day. But as much as we'd like to say this one's a bust, Dr. B actually kind of agrees with the new portion sizes. What we're doing is just lowering that number that we define as moderation for your overall benefits. So maybe it really is time to cut back. But besides the five a week rule, Dr. B's bottom line to have your wine without busting your health. Even though the studies has to do with wine, it's the same when it comes to a bottle of beer or a shot of hard liquor. And is not just about the amount you should be drinking or not drinking is is maybe more or less an in portion control. Because the reality is like the less you eat now, the less you drink now, you're gonna be able to eat and drink for a lot longer. So maybe don't drain the bottle on your own, but hey, don't forget. The you know, wine is fun, enjoy it with the meal. Responsibly. Maybe even if it's a glass fuel now and then. At the decanter. Ryan Scott, Fox News. June 10th, 830 at night, Alfredo Nunez, 69 years old, in the white shirt, walking with his bicycle when he is attacked on Flagler Street. My wallet? I don't remember. He doesn't remember because he was knocked out cold. Watch. Me, me go, you know, in, a, in the concrete. He hit the concrete hard. See the video here? Watch. Is this the first time you're seeing the video? Yes? Yeah, he's going this way. It's the first time he is seeing the video. He's going to hit you hard, and then he's going to hit you again. The thug takes his wallet. Oh, maybe... $15, maybe $10. All this over $10, yeah. $15. Weeks later, the welt on Alfredo's face still there after this brutal blow. Suerte a la vida. Claro. We ask him if he feels yeah, lucky to be know. alive, and he says, of course. Now police need your help to catch this heartless crook. This looks like any bridal fashion runway show, but these gorgeous gowns are made out of toilet paper. Featuring over 1,600 feet of spindle spun quilted northern thread. Contestants rolling out their unconventional dresses on the runway of New York's famed Kleinfeld Bridal Shop for the 14th annual Toilet Paper Wedding Dress Contest Wednesday. More than 1,500 designers were hoping to have their tissue attire walk the runway but only the top 10 TP looks were selected to compete. Each delicate dress had to be carefully crafted using only toilet paper, tape, glue, and thread. Because it's so delicate, it's very easy to break, and you gotta keep it together. You gotta, it's like an architecture. You create the fabric first, and then you build it to a style. This year, designers used between 12 and 54 rolls on each dress. But don't be fooled, these paper couture gowns are not just thrown together. It took me probably two months, a lot of preparations, a lot of planning, a lot of education, cutting, rolling, gluing, and everything. They're crafted down to the very last detail, mimicking the latest bridal trends before hitting the runway. Contestants are judged based on originality, beauty, creativity, and workmanship. This year's winner was Ronaldo Cruz from Virginia. He took home a $10,000 prize. That can buy a lot of TP. In New York, Jackie Abanez, Fox News.
More than 2,000 children have been separated from their parents since a zero-tolerance policy for those who enter the U.S. illegally began to be enforced in May. Powerful and at times heart-rending images of separated families have sparked demonstrations in a number of U.S. cities and outrage across the political spectrum. We spend a lot of money all over the world promoting human rights and democracy and respect for children. And in our own country, we're treating children in a way which describes torture. Some of the holding facilities are Spartan, little more than mats on caged floors with foil blankets or cots in desert tents. But there has also been some pushback from the men and women who risk their lives to protect the nation's borders. What's inhumane is putting your child in the trunk of a car. What's inhumane is taking your child and crossing that river. The Associated Press initially reported the existence of at least three tender age shelters in Texas. The Department of Health and Human Services said the goal of such shelters is to keep children and parents as close as possible until the end of court proceedings for those who entered the U.S. illegally. These children are very small. Uh, many of them don't understand what's going on. They're traumatized by having been pulled from their parents. With an understaffed federal bureaucracy, language barriers and illiteracy, reuniting parents and children could prove challenging. Plans to add another tender age shelter to a converted warehouse in Houston have run into local opposition. And there comes a time when Americans, when Houstonians, when Texans have to say to those higher than ourselves, this is wrong. A physician who recently toured this tender age shelter described it to Fox News thus. 15 toddlers age 1 to 3 in a room. A homey feeling, plenty of cribs, toys and books, a competent, caring staff doing their best. She also said it was abnormal, eerily quiet. For the first time in 30 years as a pediatrician, she was in a room full of toddlers, and none of them were climbing, playing, or even crying. In Combs, Texas, Steve Harrigan, Fox News. She also said... The tomb is hallowed ground. It's, it's our most sacred and hallowed ground in America. The tomb of the unknown soldiers at Arlington National Cemetery. To this day, one of the most treasured attractions here in our nation's capital. And it's a majestic place. Where members of the 3rd U.S. Infantry Regiment, the Old Guard, stand watch 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The changing of the guards, a solemn ritual played out before tens of thousands of visitors every year. This represents who we are as Americans. It represents all the sacrifices that were made by those who had fallen in battle for America. Author Patrick O'Donnell has written a new book called The Unknowns about our government's effort at the end of World War I to honor all Americans killed in battle with a tomb for one of the unidentified war dead. Initially, the War Department was very res resistant to the idea of an unknown soldier. They felt that they could identify um, all the unknown soldiers. There were about 2,500 in World War I, but that didn't happen. And then there was a movement after France and England both selected an unknown soldier to have an American unknown soldier. Documented with historical photographs, the effort began in 1921. The unknown soldier chosen after unidentified caskets were unearthed from four American cemeteries in France. And they were about to give a general officer the, um, the right to select the, uh, the unknown for America, the America's unknown soldier. But the French said, no, you should use an enlisted man to select the unknown. That man was Edward Younger, who had fought in some of the toughest battles of World War I, was wounded twice, was given a bouquet of flowers to help make the selection. He walked into the chapel and laid the bouquet on one of the caskets, and he felt that the man that, that was in that casket had died next to him in battle, and it was one of his friends. He didn't know for sure, but he thought so? He was powerfully drawn to that, that individual. And to this day, we don't know who that person we is. We don't know who that person is. The flag-draped casket brought to the U.S. on board the USS Olympia. The other three caskets were buried again in France. The heart of this book, though, is about the body bearers, the men that Pershing personally selected General John Pershing, commander of U.S. forces on the Western Front. They're the most decorated enlisted men of the war to bring back the remains. 
and their stories tell the story of America's involvement in World War I. It's a forgotten generation. It's a generation that changed the world. They remade the world. Inscribed on the back of the tomb is this. Here rests in honored glory an American soldier known but to God. At Arlington National Cemetery, Bob Barnard, Fox 5 Local News. Well, take a look behind me. The owner of Carvana says his 90-foot coin-operated vending machine is about to change the way you purchase a car. We wanted to, you know, make car buying fun again. And when we thought about a pickup experience, we didn't want it to be a dealership in disguise. There are no salespeople in our business. When you show up here and get the car, Founder of Carvana, Ryan Keaton, says this is the 12th vending machine the company built and the largest. Customers order online. They receive notice when the order is ready and then head over to the vending machine to pick up a commemorative coin. At this point, you put it in. And once you put it in, you'll see the lights change, the machine comes alive, basically, and it starts the whole process. We are a completely vertically integrated retailer of used vehicles, meaning that we sell cars online, we've got more than 10,000. Inside the vending machine, a lift heads up to retrieve the vehicle. The selection is carefully placed on a platform and brought down. And once we'll see here, once we land, the car will be brought into the corridor. Then they'll be able to kind of see the car come towards them. We do a fun little spin of the car and then vend it into one of the four bays that are here. The experience is meant to be easy and hassle-free, one where the buyer is in control. People have migrated to buy other things online, and we built the technology that enables you to buy it in 10 minutes. Carvana officially opens to the public today. Anita Roman, Fox 10 News. Martha Heft learned to sew at just five years old. I took home it in high school because I knew that with sewing, I would have no trouble in getting an A. And 94 years later, the great-grandmother of 16 is touching the lives of children around the world, one stitch at a time. Heft meets with her church group every week to create dozens of dresses for underprivileged girls using donated fabric. The colorful dresses are made out of donated pillowcases, and last month, the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office delivered over 60 of them to an orphanage in Puerto Rico. We would love to hug her and to give her a big kiss. We feel very blessed. He's very blessed to, to know people like her. Oh, you made me cry. <laughs> the dresses came in all sizes and colors and attached to each one, an inspirational note written in Spanish. Smile because we love you. Her generosity has also spread to Haiti, where dozens of her pillowcase dresses were sent after the devastating earthquake in 2010. Heft received a certificate of appreciation from the sheriff's office for her dedication to children. She sneaks in a few hours of sewing every day. It's a joy, an accomplishment, and a pleasure. But you won't find her with a needle and thread on Sundays. She says that's a day of rest. She's an inspiration. We kind of have to pinch ourselves to remember that she's the age she is and she stays as active as she does. Heft hopes to continue sewing for years to come. As long as God graces me, I hope he graces me five more years when you see all the fabric I have to sew. And most people receive gifts on their birthday, but not Heft. She's turning 100 and wants to spend her special day doing her favorite thing, giving to others. But I'm grateful that I am here, that I can sew. So I enjoy it very much. In Clearwater, Florida, Ali Rafa, Fox News. Sake is a fermented rice brew. Nowadays, when most people in America think of sake, a hibachi restaurant comes to mind. The owners of North American Sake are trying to change that perspective. They say sake is a lot like craft beer, where it can be very experimental. We're going to have a couple of traditional flagships, both a clear and a cloudy sake, but we're also going to do a lot of fun things like infusions with fruit and herbs um, and a lot of experimental batches with hops and different rice varieties, different yeasts. Over 6,000 pounds of rice is used per month in barrels like these, but rice is also going to be featured here in the restaurant where they'll be serving both for lunch and dinner Asian-inspired meals while also having their sake on tap. We'll be serving lunch and dinner, looking to do rice bowls, uh, poke bowls, uh, sushi, tasting flights, 
uh, draft boards that'll actually be on tap, which is something you don't really see that often in sake places. We'll also have bottles that you can take home. Both Goldstein and Sentafonte know that sake may not be the most popular adult beverage in America, but they are excited for the opportunity to share their love for the drink, and they believe they can change the public's perception of the Japanese rice wine. I drink cider, I drink beer, I drink wine, and I drink sake. And I think that that's what we hope to do, is introduce people to it as something that you can have anytime, anywhere, on a, a hot summer day. It can be really, really refreshing. Uh, you can warm it up on a cold winter's night, and uh, it's really delicious, too. I just found out yesterday, and if this is so, I'll just go back. I don't want to be separated from my kid. In Tijuana, Mexico, President Trump's immigration policy has immigrants guessing. A couple days before, I'll decide if I say or go. I don't want to be separated from my kids. These women told our interpreter they did not want their faces shown for fear of retribution. When they fled violence at home weeks ago, they'd never heard of zero tolerance. Then these photos appeared on their phone of immigrant children behind a chain link fence. Say I have two kids, they'll take them away and they'll send them to a shelter. Won't that stop you from going to America knowing you could lose your children? If it comes to the choice where I have to choose between my kids and crossing, I'll keep my kids. At the port of entry, immigrants from around the world line up to seek asylum. For many, it's a long wait. They lose patience and cross illegally. Fraud, say border agents, is not uncommon. It would be a group of five or seven that all had the same answers and nobody was related. And what does that tell us? Uh, to me, that tells me they're coached. Most are economic migrants. They embellish stories of violence or persecution, hoping to qualify for asylum. It's up to an immigration judge to separate fact from fiction. So the men you see behind me are from Cameroon. They've been on the road for four months, but here in Tijuana for three weeks, waiting to ask for asylum. Someone wants to kill me. I don't believe that United States will allow someone to kill me. Across town, this shelter is filled with immigrants waiting to cross. This young man made the dangerous journey alone. Why would a parent allow that? Because Amara takes the children. Boys in Honduras, he says, have little choice when MS-13 comes calling. Police look for older people, but they don't look for children. The parents prefer them to travel alone than to stay in Honduras and be captured by the Mara. The administration hoped that separating children and prosecuting everyone would help deter illegal immigration. But the bigger problem right now is the booming U.S. economy, which immigrants here say the promise of a job is overriding many of the risks and the uncertainty of getting here and getting across. In Tijuana, William Lajeunesse, Fox News. So amid the outcry of immigrant children being separated from their parents, many lawmakers are down at facilities and near the border today to talk about this and answer questions. And actually, we're coming up on uh, soon to be President Trump speaking, I believe, from the White House. He'll be meeting with a, what, what they call angel families. These are families whose loved ones uh, were killed by illegal immigrants. So amid some of this outcry, he will now meet with um, these families. Uh, and and talk about this. He sort of gave a preview to this meeting in a tweet from this morning, and here's what he tweeted this morning um, about maintaining a strong southern border, not allowing the country to be overrun by illegal immigrants. So we will see very soon what he has to say about that and what uh, he puts forward in this meeting with these families. But meanwhile, guys, Senator Marco Rubio is down in Florida. I believe he is about to visit one of these facilities with migrant children or he has just done so and he's answering some questions from uh, the press in uh, what seems to be an open uh, meeting. He's up at the podium right now. So let's check in down there. Then we're going to take it back and make sure that we get President Trump live. So if you are here on the stream for that, that is coming up next. Because they have to leave and flee violence and so forth. We have to ensure that when, if they do arrive, that we treat them to the highest standards possible but also that we don't have any policies in place that incentivize more people to do this in the future because it's, it's dangerous. It's not, it is not a safe journey, and, and we know that people are being harmed and killed on that path here. Did you get to talk to children? No, they had a very strict policy about respecting the privacy of the children, and so we respected that policy. Well, you came to the center. Well, obviously, it's a center for children and a situation very difficult. For one part, as the most rich country of the world, we have an obligation. De, de las personas que estén bajo nuestro cuidado, especialmente niños, sea lo que sea, 
no importa el estatus legal que tengan, hay que tratarlo de la manera mejor posible. Por otra parte, no podemos tener ninguna política que, que cree un incentivo para que más personas tomen ese viaje que es sumamente peligroso. Sabemos que el viaje a Estados Unidos eh, eh, cruzando esa frontera es un viaje sumamente peligroso. Sabemos que personas mueren, son asaltados, abusados en ese, en, ese, en ese viaje y no debemos tener ninguna política que dé un incentivo para ese tipo de, de, de viaje. ¿Pero pueden aclarar su posición sobre la detención de niños inmigrantes? Bueno, ¿Deben ser separados? ¿Deben ser no, yo lo he dicho claramente, que yo espero que mientras que esperan su audiencia, familias deben estar juntos. Desafortunadamente, eso no fue la política hasta un par de días y ahora lo que tenemos que es invertir en la capacidad de poder eh, lograr eso, eh, que no, te, no existe esa capacidad en ese momento. Bueno, eh, tienen una política de no hablar con los niños, porque obviamente hay que, hay, queremos proteger la, la, la privacidad eh, de, de los niños, eh, pero sí podemos ver las, las aulas eh, donde duermen, eh, lo que nos enseñaron y obviamente ningún centro como esto es ideal, porque no es ideal tener a nadie en, en detención, pero, pero creo que no puedo opinar sobre otros centros en el país, pero le puedo opinar sobre lo que yo vi, fue un lugar donde están tratando de hacer lo más posible en circunstancias muy difíciles, ¿no? Sure, I sympathize with uh, anyone who's seeking a better life. I think the challenge is the United States accepts over a million people a year legally. Over a million, no other country in the world even comes close. And 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 so, pardon? Oh, you're in her way. I'm sorry. The uh, the United States already accepts over one million people a year legally. We have a process for legal entry. Uh, what we're dealing with now are in addition to that. And every country in the world has migratory laws, every single one. I was in Honduras two years ago and I visited a migrant center and they, they, they enforce their laws um, in, in ways, by the way, that are much stricter than ours. And so I would say to you that, of course we do. And like my parents, people continue to arrive every day in the United States and they do so through a legal process. And that's what we need to encourage. And that's what we need to continue to have. I don't seek to restrict that. I also think we have to do something reasonable about people that have been here for a very long time and are not dangerous or are not committed serious crimes. Uh, but we cannot have policies in place that incentivize more people to come here illegally for two reasons. One, no country can do that. No country has the capacity to be able to handle that. And the other is it is dangerous for the people that are doing it. The, the, the trip across unlawfully across the United States border requires you oftentimes to be exposed to some of the most dangerous people on this planet trafficking networks and others who are the big winners in all of this. These are horrible human beings that do horrible things to migrants and any policies we have in place to incentivize that journey is actually inhumane in my view. Senator, what bothers you most about splitting a family? What bothers everyone? Families shouldn't be split. And it's, and it's a terrible situation that's happening and it puts us in a tough situation. So we have to try to do the best we can and you have to balance the desire to keep families together and live up to our standards as a country with the reality that we cannot have policies in place that encourage others to undergo the same dangerous journey that's happening now, because that's inhumane too. Your, your position is together, correct? Take that's cor that's okay. correct. Is there, is, is there a time frame with respect to that? Because well, that's one of the things in our bill that we have put in place is an additional 230 judges so that these hearings can be moved quicker, whether it's asylum, uh, whether it's some other status or whether it's being returned, that we can speed up the process of these hearings so that people aren't sitting there and languishing for long periods of time. And so that's one of the things we do in our bill is we, we create more immigration judge positions to be able to process these, these cases can faster. Were able to speak to those children, if you were able to talk to them, what would you want to know from them and what would you say to them? What well, um, obviously all these children have different situations that brought them here. This center is primarily unaccompanied minors that came. So, um, uh, but you know, obviously, I wouldn't want to hear more about the conditions in their homeland that would force someone to undertake a journey of that nature. We're aware of how bad those things are in places. El Salvador is one of the most dangerous countries in the world. Honduras continues to face those challenges. And I think hearing those stories would hopefully compel my colleagues to join me in investing more and helping these sort of country, these countries confront these challenges domestically. Because if I'm close to the president of Honduras, we talk often about this. Honduras cannot rebuild if it's losing its young people, if it's losing its talent. And so in an ideal world, they would not, there would not be a Honduras that people have to flee because of violence or a lack of economic opportunity. And, and we face this in other places. You know, Colombia had a migratory crisis. Brazil did at one time as well. 
and those countries have turned it around so you don't have those same pressures we'd be hopeful that we can help them uh, to overcome that so in five seven ten years we have countries that people don't have to leave beca because of violence and because of lack of opportunity all right guys thank you thank you so much families below free so Senator Marco Rubio down there in Florida, I believe he had just uh, a few moments ago toured that migrant facility. So we were told he was going to be speaking right before. Turns out, I, I believe he he did tour it. I don't think he got too close, as close as he wanted to get to some of those children. But um, his remarks there to the media, pretty straightforward there. And on the heels of uh, all of this happening and uh, going forward, President Trump in a few moments about to speak on immigration himself right here in D.C., setting the stage right there is uh, the podium and the president will be speaking about immigration with angel families. Angel families are those whose loved ones have been killed by illegal immigrants. Uh, this is all coming uh, during a week of uh, amid lots of tension about this topic. He tweeted this morning uh, to, that we do need to remain strong at the border. And I believe this speech will be uh, mostly sort of about that. He'll be putting the spotlight on some of those families that we've heard about in the news who have had loved ones killed by illegal immigrants. Um, some of these parents whose children have been killed by illegal immigration, immigrants have actually formed a grassroots organization in California. Uh, it's called Fight Sanctuary State. Uh, so it seeks to promote more cooperation with state and federal officials and agents in controlling that. Uh, but all very interesting, of course. This is uh, coming up right now in the next few moments. If anything else is breaking, any other live video we can pull in, we'll show you. But I believe this is uh, set to start in just a few moments.
Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, accompanied by the Vice President of the United States. Thank you, everybody. We actually spent some time together, so I didn't mind giving you a second hello. <laughs> Not at all. We've known each other a long time. We've been friends for a long time, from the beginning of the campaign. And uh, this, these are special people. Please sit down. Vice President Pence, thank you very much for joining us, Mike. I also want to recognize Acting Director Homan, who's leaving us. He's been truly a star, and uh, he's leaving. He's retiring. But where is Tom? Is he around here someplace? Yeah. Tom, stand up, Tom. Yeah. Great guy. Tom has been uh, doing what he's doing for 34 years and doing it with strength and uh, dedication, and you are really outstanding. And uh, your, your highly recommended replacement is going to do a great job. We know him well. He's going to do really great. Thank you, Tom, for those years of service. I also want to thank the incredible ICE officers, Border Patrol agents, and law enforcement officials who join us here today. Uh, if you could stand up, please. These people are also special. People. Thank you. Thank you. And they're good looking people, aren't they? Huh? Yeah. Good looking people. Thank you very much for being here for the bravery. What you do and what you endure is incredible. I also want to stand and have the brave men and women from all over government agencies. We have a lot. Just maybe just raise your hand or stand, but we really appreciate the job that you've done, especially during the last year and a half, because I know you've really put in a lot of extra. So please, thank you very much. Thank you. We're gathered today to hear directly from the American victims of illegal immigration. You know, you hear the other side, you never hear this side. You don't know what's going on. These are the American citizens permanently separated from their loved ones. The word permanently being the word that you have to think about, permanently. They're not separated for a day or two days. They are permanently separated because they were killed by criminal illegal aliens these are the families the media ignores. They don't talk about them. Very unfair. We have to look at everybody. But this is a very unfair situation. And I knew that years ago when we would be together out campaigning. And I said, if this ever happens, we're never forgetting you. You know that, Laura, everybody. Incredible people. And they're dedicated. These are the stories that Democrats and people that are weak on immigration, they don't want to discuss, they don't want to hear, they don't want to see, they don't want to talk about. No major network sent cameras to their homes or display the images of their incredible loved ones across the nightly news. They don't do that. They don't talk about the death and destruction caused by people that shouldn't be here, people that will continuously get into trouble and do bad things. For years, their pain was met with silence. Their plight was met with indifference, but no more. I told them three years ago, when we were together, day one, just about day one, I would say, I said, I hear you, I see you, and I will never let you down. And we've been working together, and uh, their loved ones have not died in vain. We all know that. We call these brave Americans the angel families, angel moms, Angel Pops, these are the angel families. 
Your loss will not have been in vain. We will secure our borders, and we will make sure that they're properly taken care of. Eventually, the word will get out. We've got to have a safe country. We're going to have a safe country. And your loved ones are going to be playing and will continue to play a big part in it. You know that, right? You know that. So here are just a few statistics on the human toll of illegal immigration. According to a 2011 government report, the arrests attached to the criminal alien population included an estimated 25,000 people for homicide, 42,000 for robbery, nearly 70,000 for sex offenses, and nearly 15,000 for kidnapping. In Texas alone, within the last seven years, more than a quarter of a million criminal aliens have been arrested and charged with over 600,000 criminal offenses. You don't hear that. I always hear that, oh, no, the population's safer than the people that live in the country. You've heard that, fellas, right? You've heard that. I hear it so much, and I say, is that possible? The answer is it's not true. You hear it's like they're better people than what we have, than our citizens. It's not true. In 2016, more than 15,000 Americans died from a heroin overdose. More than 90 percent of the heroin comes from across the southern border. 90 percent. As a result of sanctuary city policies and fiscal 2017, more than 8,000 criminal aliens these are really hardcore criminal aliens. We're in police custody and were released because of our weak laws, weakest in the world, weakest in the history of the world. They were released back into our civilian population. And these gentlemen had to do some of the releasing, and I don't think you were too happy when you knew, because you knew. They know better than anybody. You knew what you were releasing. You knew it was trouble, and it often comes back to be trouble. Where is the media outrage over the catch-and-release policies that allow deadly drugs to pour into our country? Where is the condemnation of the Democrats' sanctuary cities that release violent criminals into our communities and then protect them, like the mayor of San Diego when she warned everybody that ICE is coming and they scattered a big operation, a very expensive operation. They were all together. They all scattered. And what are they going to do about looking at her, by the way? I've been asking this question now for four weeks. She can do that? And where is the outcry over the savage gang MS-13 and its bloodthirsty creed? Kill, rape, and control. Because the news media has overlooked their stories, I want the American people to hear directly from these families about the pain they have had to endure, losing not only their loved ones, great people, great Americans, people that would have been very successful, people that in some cases could have been here one day, could have been here. I know the way you feel. But could have been right here, standing here. First, I'd like to ask a friend of mine for now a long time, Laura Wilkerson from Pearland, Texas, to come and share her story about her incredible, incredible boy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Come on, Laura, just say a few words. We want to tell you a little bit today about Josh. He was uh, brutally tortured, um, strangled over and over. He was set on fire after death. His last hours were, was brutal. As everyone standing up here, none of our kids had a minute to say goodbye. We weren't lucky enough to be separated for five days or 10 days. We're separated permanently. Any time we want to see or be close to our kids, we go to the cemetery because that's where they are. We can never speak to them. We can't Skype with them. And I want to thank you so much in this room for what you're doing to understand. You, you guys know the permanent separation. It's the media that won't share it with other people. Uh, it's permanent. We can never have him back on this, this earth. Thankfully, I'll see him again in heaven. But I want to thank you, Mr. Trump and uh, Vice President Trump for, um, I mean, Vice President Pence, for keeping their commitment to us. It's, it's been ongoing. It continues on. And please understand, there are so many more of us 
than, than what you see here that had the same story over and over, drunk driving, killed, over and over, and they don't prosecute or they let go and low bond, they're out in 30 days. Uh, it, it's sad for our country and it's time to take it back and I wanna thank each and every one of you law enforcement you know it. You love it. You want to do your jobs. And thankfully, we have a president who will allow you to do that now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Next, I'd like to ask Juan Pina from Greenfield, California, to speak. Juan, please come up. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. My name is Juan Pina. First of all, I want to thank the Remembrance Project for bringing my daughter's name out to light and for candidate Trump to let me speak about her. And I've got a lot of people that I need to thank. My daughter was Christy Sue Pina back in 1990. She was kidnapped, strangled, stabbed, raped, and sodomized, and her new body was found in the artichoke field. I've been fighting for 28 and a half years. He's been fighting. He was loose for 25. In the last three and a half years, he's been fighting extradition. And on May 3rd, God answered my prayers. Mexico finally turned them loose to us, and he is now in the Monterey County Jail, and we had start court procedures for my daughter's death. And I want to thank everybody that was involved in getting them over here. The Sheriff's Department of Monterey County, for the investigator, the sheriff never told her, don't give up on this, just stay on it and stay on it. And she pinky swore that she was going to get him over there, and she did. And I just want to thank the president and everybody. And I just hope everybody can get what I just got. And I'm out here speaking for the thousands of victims that we have here in the United States. And I want to thank you all. Thank you. So Juan fought for many years, and uh, it's uh, hard to believe, but that's actually a great feeling. Yes, it is. That you just, uh, incredible job. Incredible job. Hi, Dylan. Also here with us today is Steve Ronnebeck from Mesa, Arizona. Steve, uh, if you could come up and share a few words, please. Thank you, Mr. President. January 22nd, 2015, Grant was at work on his overnight shift. <clears throat> An illegal alien came in, wanted to buy cigarettes, dumped a jar of change out on the counter. Grant went to count the change and wasn't counting fast enough. So uh, basically, this man pulled a gun. Grant did everything he was supposed to do and uh, gave him the cigarettes. The man went ahead and executed him and shot him point blank in the face. You know, you don't hear these stories, and some of our, our media won't, won't talk to you about it. Um, but this is permanent separation. For his birthday, I go to his grave for Christmas. We set up a Christmas tree on Grant's grave. I received something earlier today from Director Holman as a challenge coin. And uh, I want to thank you for that. Uh, to me, this is a sign of integrity. I wish some of our media had the same integrity as our president, our vice president, Director Holman, all of you in law enforcement. I wish some of our media had the same integrity. And I want to thank all of you, especially our law enforcement, for what you do. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, thank you. The members of Voice, Barbara Gonzalez, John Fury. AVAC, I want to thank all of them too, because they, they're helping get the stories out. 63,000 Americans since 9-11 have been killed by illegal aliens. This isn't a problem that's going away. It's getting bigger. Thank you. Sixty-three thousand. 
And that number, they say, is very low because things aren't reported. 63,000. And you don't hear about that. Also here with us today is Michelle Root from Modale, Iowa. Great place. Michelle, please come up. Thank you, Mr. President. My daughter, Sarah Root, was killed within 24 hours after graduating with a bachelor's 4.0 in criminal investigations, out celebrating, stopped at a stoplight, and rear-ended by Edwin Mejia going 70 plus miles an hour. He was arrested, but then he paid a $5,000 bail, and now he has fled. Our separation, like everybody has said, is permanent. Sarah never gets to go on to be a wife, a mother, a grandmother, an aunt. My son does not have his only sibling any longer. My life has been devastated. So has my daughter's family and friends. I want to thank President Trump and Vice President Pence, Barbara Gonzalez, John Freire, and Director Holman for all their support. They have never given up on us. AVIAC was a group that we started because we were tired of not having anybody else to go to to get information. When Sarah was killed January 31st of 2016, I had nobody, but I was thankful for my politicians in my area. And you know, President Trump was one of the first ones to reach out to my family. And he has been there from the beginning, never left our side. Now we just need to get my daughter's killer found. Again, my separation is permanent. Sarah's never coming home. I never get to take a selfie with her again. I have no more pictures of her. So please, thank you guys for everything. Keep up the great work. Our police officers, our Border Patrol, please continue to fight. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Mary Ann Mendoza, and my son, Sergeant Brandon Mendoza, was killed on May 12, 2014, on his way home from work by a three-time legal limit drunk um, who was also high on meth. He had drove over 35 miles the wrong way on four different freeways in Phoenix before slamming head on into my son's car. Um, as you know, they could fill this stage up every day for the next five months of victims of illegal alien crime, and it would just keep going. Unfortunately, we are members of a club of our children or loved ones who've been killed by illegal aliens, but there's hundreds of thousands of victims every year who are affected by illegal alien crime, rape, assault, identity theft. These are things that go unreported, unchecked, you know, if, if the public would go to IllegalAlienCrimeReport.com and see the magnitude of crimes being committed against your fellow Americans by illegal aliens allowed to stay in this country, you will be sickened because the mainstream media does not let you know what's really happening. And we are here, the members of AVIAC are here to educate the public as what's happening. And if anybody's been a victim of illegal alien crime, contact us because we have close connections with Barbara Gonzalez at ICE, John Fury. We have connections at the Department of Homeland Security that we are trying to get people the help that they need and sent in the right direction. President Trump, Vice President Pence, You've just been there for us, and there are no words to describe what your support and your caring has meant to each and every one of us. And um, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much. Come. Come. Your story is incredible. I'm one of your legal immigrants. I came the right way. I paid lots of money, it took me five years to become a citizen, a proud citizen. And I didn't drag my son, he named himself German Chocolate, he was born in Germany. I didn't drag him over borders, through deserts, I didn't place him in harm's way. I protected my child from harm, but I couldn't do that on July 12, 2012. 
He was 30 years old. I couldn't protect him because an illegal alien from Guatemala with two felonies, one deportation, two DUIs, he was protected. Riverside, California, sanctuary. The judge, the DA, they knew who he was. They gave him probation after his second DUI. Five weeks later, he killed my child. And if that wasn't enough to deal with, this is my only child. I have no family. That's it. <sighs> the public needs to know, and they deserve to know, that this could happen to each one of you at any given second. You hug your child, you send them off, no matter what age they are. And then you get that ugly phone call that will forever change your life. And thank God, our president and vice president, voice, my family of Aviac, they rallied behind us. They were the only ones and gave us a little light. I was going to end my life. I had no purpose. But President Trump coming down that escalator that day and talking about illegal immigration stopped me in my track. And I had no clue at that point that I would ever be at the White House. And I thank President Trump, Vice President Pence, everybody behind me. I thank you. I thank everybody out here. Make sure you get our stories out. I brought my son. This is what I have left, his ashes. I wear his ashes in a locket. This is how I get to hug my son. So remember when you go home and hug your kids, that there are many of us, thousands of us, who don't get to do that anymore. And let's work together and get this done. All politicians, I don't care what side you're on, you don't want your child in a casket or in an urn. So get it together, for God's sake, for this country, for our citizens. Thank you. My name is Ray Tranchant, and I uh, retired from the Navy. I flew off of aircraft carriers and had a great Navy career, and then I started my family in the 90s. I had two little girls, Tessa and Kelsey, and they had a bigger brother, Dylan. And I raised them, and uh, their mother uh, and her mom is Hispanic, and so Tessa was Hispanic. And they lived near the river as well. Um, Tessa and was 16. She was a dreamer, and so was her friend Allie Coonhart, 17 years old, 16 years old, both beautiful girls, and they just loved talking about the future. Uh, they went to uh, a Wawa in Virginia Beach to get a pack of gum, and they were stopped at a stoplight, and um, Alfredo Ramos was driving uh, at 70 miles an hour. Uh, he was three times the legal limit. He had been arrested before for DUI in which the judge um, gave him no time or, or fines. He had a fake ID from Florida bought by the cartels. Uh, he had a fake driver's uh, license on his car, uh, and he couldn't speak English. And he needed an interpreter for the last DUI hearing. Uh, he was also arrested for drunken public. Bottom line is he came in through Mesa, and he tried to make it, and he, he was going, he was three times the legal limit, so the police told me that at that, it's like wearing almost blackout glasses while you're driving. When he hit the girls from behind, it, it was an explosion. The neighborhood thought a bomb went off. Uh, the girls were almost instantaneously dead. They worked on Tessa for a while, and, and I got to see her in the hospital. There, those are the dreamers that the United States should focus on. I can't, I can't make an opinion about the young people that are here illegally because their parents brought them. But I can guarantee you the government had nothing to do with that. And everybody wants to blame. But the parents of those children are to blame. And there was a lot of, well, maybe they'll feel sorry for them because they're kids, and maybe if they behave, they'll just magically beat the system. My mom came from Ireland. It took her 10 years to get her citizenship. 
she had a sponsor. If she got in trouble, not only did she get in trouble, the sponsor was in trouble. I would have been speaking Northern Irish right now if she got out of line. That's the way it was with INS in those days. And mom loved being an American. I helped her study for exam. So I'm all about legal immigration. But the invaders and people who come over our borders and decide to take the law in their own hands and maybe are supported by a group of people that for God's sakes, I don't know why they would want to do it. It's evil, it hurts people, and it costs us billions of dollars a year. And they don't seem to want to pay for it. They want us to pay for it, the other taxpayers. I want to thank President Trump because when my, those kids died, I was, in, I was a city employee. Uh, so, uh, of course, I sued the city and uh, the judge and the adjoining city with the judge there. And, of course, you know, they're immune. But it didn't make me really friendly with the city. It didn't make me friendly with ICE because basically uh, they claimed they weren't called. The sheriff's department said that uh, we called them and it was a back and forth. So no one took responsibility. So being in that situation where no one takes responsibility in this government at all means that you're standing in a dark forest at night when it's raining and it's cold and you're lost. Everybody you talk to, yeah, 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 but, you know, he was drunk, and, you know, we have a lot of drunks here, and blah, blah. Let me tell you, the guy shouldn't have been there at that time. He shouldn't have been there, and we had many opportunities to, to get him out. So, what's happening? Our uh, representative is the president and the vice president. They took us in, and we're going to fight this battle, and we're going to win it. And we're going to clean it up. And uh, I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud to be a part of that. And I will support you as law enforcement and my president and vice president as much as they need. Uh, I want to thank the Remembrance Project for standing there when I had no one else. And uh, God bless you. And I hope this doesn't happen to you. Thank you. Sir. This is Tom Selleck, <laughs> except better looking, right? Better looking. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Angel Mom Agnes Gibney. My family legally immigrated from Hungary. They, we escaped during the revolution. We couldn't come to the United States as my mother planned because my father was born in Yugoslavia and they wanted us to stay. And because my mother said no, they didn't allow us to come to, to the American embassy. We went to, we had a choice of uh, South Africa, Austria, or Brazil. We went to Brazil and uh, lived there 13 years trying to legally immigrate to the United States. When we immigrated to Brazil, we were stateless. We didn't belong anywhere because the government took our citizenship because we escaped. And when we came to the United States, we were stateless. And I'm very honored and proud to say this is my home, my country, and I will fight for this country until my death. Thank you, law enforcement, uh, Border Patrol, uh, immigration, uh, Barbara, everybody that got me here today. And thank you for fighting this fight with us, because trust me, you don't want to walk in our shoes. And President Trump, thank you for always standing behind us. You are the biggest birthday present I got. And I'm still waiting for that shovel to help build the wall at the border. I live in California. And I would like to ask if you don't want your state to become a sanctuary state. So I would like to ask President Trump if you would tweet and endorse us to fight sanctuarystate.com to help us so we're not gonna go down because if California continues in this path, the rest of the country will follow. And I am so proud and honored of you, Mr. President, the integrity and character that you have shown us Pulling the daggers out of your back every day is not, it hasn't been fair, but I want you to know that I'm very honored to call you my president. And God bless you and your family always, and Mr. Pence, and God bless this country. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. This is my son, Drew. He was in law school in San Francisco in 2010 when Roberto Gallo tried to make a last second left hand turn and hit him. Instead of stopping, he tried to flee, so he accelerated, drove over his body. My son was on a motorcycle. His helmet came off, wedged under one of his tires. He backed up, driving over him a second time, and then trying to get away, um, went forward. By that time, a guy had gotten out of the car and stood in front of Gallows, and he stopped with his rear tire on my son's abdomen, and five Five people had to lift the car off of him. But I want to talk about somebody else. And you, you heard Agnes mention FightSanctuaryState.com. Um, in April of this year, I filed uh, with the state of California an initiative to overturn the sanctuary state. Um, there's just way too many deaths, uh, way too many traffic collisions. I should just add on an aside, you know, we got, we gave out driver's licenses in 2015, and in two years, the first two years of that, traffic fatalities on what was supposed to be safer roads have gone up 19%, hit and runs have gone up 26%. Yet they're still telling people the roads are safer because of that. But there's so many other, and somebody who's not here, a woman named Veronica Cabrera Ramirez, um, to give you an example of what happens with sanctuary, um, she was, was a domestic violence victim, called the Santa Rosa police. They arrested um, the perpetrator. He was, had been deported previously. Um, ICE filed a detainer. Um, and then uh, the day that they decided to release him, instead of calling ICE and giving ICE a chance to show up, uh, they were an hour and a half away, uh, they gave him 16 minutes to show up and they released him. And 16 days later, he murdered um, Ms. Ramirez. And according to Kevin DeLeon, who was the author of the Sanctuary Bill, that makes the state safer if you keep the federal police, the federal law enforcement over here, and you keep the state law enforcement here, that makes the state safer. That's absurd, it's outrageous, and something has to be done, and I hope that, um, as, as Agnes said, if, if, this, if we don't kill this in, in California, it will spread, and I know it already is in some places. It's a death sentence for American law-abiding citizens. Anyway, I'd like to thank the president and the vice president, everybody else who's here. Uh, Director Holman, thank you so much. You've become a credible friend. John Fury, Barbara Gonzalez, and my new friend today, Kristen Nielsen. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you all very much, particularly law enforcement. Yeah. And I just said, would you like to speak? And you said, no. I, I cry too. She said, I've been crying for too long for too much, so it's fine, right? That's good. Well, I just want to thank everybody for uh, being here. Uh, I've, uh, I know these families. I know many more families that have gone through the same thing. And uh, I cannot imagine it being any worse, but we pledge to act with strength and with resolve and in the memory of those who have been lost so needlessly. And it's because of families like yours that my administration created the new office of DHS, the Victims of Immigrant Crime Engagement, which has been doing, I hear, a fantastic job. They call it voice, so that your voices can be heard. Today, we have released the first voice report within the first months of voice. Uh, we've opened more than 2,800 victims registered to receive information on their perpetrator. We're following these people. We're following them. So it can't happen again by that individual. Voice assisted hundreds of families already connected them to crucial services such as grief counseling, followed up their cases, and helped ensure that the criminal aliens that harmed their families so egregiously were detained, removed, and deported our first duty and our highest loyalty is to the citizens of the United States. We want safety in our country. 
We want border security. We don't want people in our country that don't go through a process. We want people in our country based on merit, not based on a draw, where other countries put their absolute worst in a bin and they start drawing people. Well, you think they're going to put their good ones? They don't put their good ones. They put their bad ones. And then when they commit crimes, we're so surprised. We'll not rest until our border is secure, our citizens are safe, and we finally end the immigration crisis once and for all. We want safety in our country. We want strong borders. We want people to come in, but we want them to come in the proper way. So thank you all for being here. These are incredible families, incredible people. Your loved ones have not died in vain. Much of what we're doing today is because of what you've had to endure. And we just thank you all very much for being here. And God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.